welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. Open mic number 196. Hope everyone's doing uh, good uh, this uh, fine, well, cold afternoon here in Michigan. And I think it's cold out there in the west side, west coast, at Rhonda's place, and snowy. You keep that shit way over there or send it south. Fine with me. We've had enough, though. Anyway... Uh, today we're going to be jumping back into the depositions, and our our um, I'll start to say victim. My bad. Uh, our deposition uh, today is going to be or tonight is going to be uh, Ken Peterson. Mm -hmm. He's the second one, as I said before, on October thirteenth. There were one, two, three. Yeah, there were five depositions. And Ken Peterson was the second one. We finished uh, Dvorak. It was a couple hours, if you guys remember. This one's not quite as long. So, anyway, I'll let everybody say hello right quick before we get rolling here. We'll say hello to everybody in the live chat. We're not going to mess around. we got uh, probably a couple hours, if, or just shy of that, uh, reading to do. So, we'll let everybody say hello right quick, and we'll get moving. So, Rhonda, how about yeah? Doing okay. Thank you, Jack. Welcome to everybody in the chat and on the panel. And um, in case you're on basic meteorology and temperatures and things like that, snow doesn't tend to do well in the south, so it's pretty much coming going east. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Well, you know, this time of year it'd be rare for a snowstorm to hit south it's a bit too warm i've seen it happen but when i lived when i lived down south but didn't it was very rare yes all righty well, even in the even in the winter it's very rare so i mean well tech, when i when i was where i live in utah we can it's considered a desert technically here but we oh, well. have you know plenty of snow and stuff in the winter so sure you know. sure but yeah anyway all right sorry Carry on. Yeah, no problem. I know I, I I saw quite a bit of snow when I was growing up when I was younger, but weather weather has changed. You know, we just have to recognize it's just different than it was. Sure, it was different this year too for for here. I, I know you got quite a bit of stuff, but we didn't get much snow at all by normal standards. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, thank you, Rhonda. Sheree. Hello. As far as the winter weather, it's the same here as your as your area, Jack. We haven't got nearly what the snow we usually get, and nearly the amount. And I want to say yeah. hello, everybody, and welcome to Open Mic. Yeah, I, I saw a, a map the other day. Not to get off on a weather shit, but um, just areas across the Midwest and the and the North. And, and um and or especially in the northeast side where you're towards where you live and most places are 18 at minimum a foot and a half to two uh, and and above Min 18 inches was the i think the minimum that we uh, snow we didn't see and most places were considerably more than that i mean there's been a few years here we've seen over 100 inches just since we moved here in 2007 over 100 inches of snow so it, and we didn't get nowhere near that so anyway all righty jd thanks for joining us how are you doing hi i'm very well thank you jack i'd like to say hi to everybody that's on the panel and everybody else that's in the chat thank you jay it's good to see you dr silkman how are you sir i'm doing well thank you so much jack 61 and uh, a warm welcome to everyone on the panel and everyone in chat, it's great to be here. I'll, I will be sort of like in and out on this podcast, but I'll definitely be listening in. And, uh, yeah, really looking forward to this deposition. Thank you so much, Jack, this one for putting it on. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I know you had some things to do, but appreciate you stopping by. And just, you know, you do what you got to do, take care of business. So. Um, yep. Uh, Rhonda, can you see the live chatters and give them a quick shout-out? I'll get this document pulled up. You betcha. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, Double D was our first chatter. And Pete Mouse, hello. 
How are you, Pete Moss? And Passive Bear, great to have you, Passive Bear. And Gloria, Gloria. Oh, um, and Anthony D. <laughs> and <laughs> Colette M. I can't help but it. it just it just uh, it just happens. Right. Uh, right. Colette M. <laughs> Uh, T. Lopez is a new member, so welcome, T. Lopez, and thank you so much. Uh, Rhonda S.D., my sweet friend in the U.K., Behind the Magic, True Crime Fangirl, uh, Sila442, Stuart King, Millie Hill, Pete Moss, Under Your Scars, Grammy, how are you, Anthony Hills, Paul Ward, Scooby the Dog, and... Andy B and Nosy Wren. JD is in the chat. Dr. Silkman is in the chat. <laughs> exactly, exactly, Scooby. Um, uh, welcome to all of you. And uh, we'll try to catch others as they. Uh, oh, well, thank you, Gloria. I don't think so, but thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we'll we'll catch more as they as they pop in. Absolutely, yeah. Um... This deposition, and I know that's a pretty gross photo, but you know it is what it is. This deposition is uh, 94 pages, but you know by the time you subtract the index out, it's going to be probably 80 something. So, let's say about an hour and a half or so, we should be good. Uh, okay, alrighty. Um, so I just want to read this out for Doc because I know he might be struggling to see it. But Scooby the Dog says, Good day, Dr. Silkman. I'm dog sitting for a pup whose parents are in your land of Oz. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Scooby. That's funny. <laughs> oh, did I? Oh. Let's see. Nosy. Did I say nosy? I just now. You did. It. You did. I did? Yep. Oh, God. Yep. You okay. did. You did say nosy. Hey, what happened I there? I don't remember. I hate it when StreamYard does that. The black screen. I, I have no idea why it does that. Get back the black screen of death. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, you know, if I, I was messing with the page there and uh, I clicked off of it, but I still, it's still running in, my, in the background clicked off of it and the screen went black it's like what the um well, that happens when i'm live too when i'm scrolling i know i've seen it i've seen it happen on yours too it must it? be a must be a stream mm -hmm. glitch yeah okay all righty let's uh let's go through this get some maybe get a few parts assigned and we're gonna we're gonna move on unless somebody has uh anything they they need to bring up uh I, you know I'm going to bring this up, and I, I'm just doing it just for a FYI, PSA, public service announcement or whatever. I, I don't know how many of you have uh, X or Twitter or whatever, but uh, it's interesting seeing the kind of the fireworks going on. I know Doc will agree. Fireworks? What fireworks? <laughs> well, well <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been interesting the last couple of days on, on Twitter, I'd say that. Uh, couple threads uh it certainly has lit up and uh there's some really good conversations um going on i had a great conversation with a gentleman named aaron um on x and you know it was a really good friendly cordial exchange um you know he asked a lot of great questions and uh it was a really good good conversation um mr uh, kratz has joined uh, in the fray um, and he's asking questions to me and to foul play. And uh, so, yeah, it's uh, very interesting times at the moment. Yep. Um, <laughs> I did post a question to him uh, actually on that original uh, Wisconsin Law Journal that he, uh, he retweeted article about uh, – Zellner's new uh, new motion and so forth. I posted a question under that that tweet he made, and, but uh, I checked it earlier, and he hadn't he hasn't attempted to answer it. I suspect he won't. I'm not sure that he has an answer. And it's concerning the uh, disturbed earth, all the disturbed earth uh, 
affidavit things that Uyghur said and getting some kind of explanation of what happened to the bloody object in the back of the raft found by Harrington on November 6, 2005. What happened to it? Yeah. Uh, to me, this is a, it, it, it's a, that's almost a, it's almost a surreal thing to think about, you know, finding out that many years after we were into the case, you know, found out, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> what, what the hell is this? I, it, well, well, I mean, that, that's right, Jack 61, and uh, not, not to waste any more time. It's very interesting that uh, through many years of hard work um, by a lot of people, uh, we now have got a lot of information that the jury never listened to or heard oh. or saw. Right. Um, it was They were blocked from getting it. It, it, it was either yeah. not available, buried, um, yeah. stipulated Correct. out. Anyway, go ahead, Doc. Uh, but it's very interesting how there there are many misconceptions uh, about the case, just the basic forensic evidence. A yeah. lot of people are making huge mistakes um, and uh, leaps of faith. And uh, when you point it out, um, you don't really get much of a response. Um, but again, it, I mean, you know, X as a medium, it's good or bad. I don't think it's as volatile as, say, something like Reddit. But it's interesting that if that is indeed Mr. Kratz, I suspect that it is, um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how he answers uh, some of our questions and criticisms of uh, going forward in the case. You know, it's important to keep it civil, um, keep your eye on the ball, um, and, and I think it should be very interesting. Yeah, uh, you, you, and you're right about uh, X or Twitter um, in, in it, it just depends on the thread, and they've they've changed the uh, guidelines on on Twitter. They're 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 pretty harsh, you know. If you get too far, well, actually not that far out of line, and somebody reports you, uh, they'll put you in Twitter jail, and sometimes they won't let you unlock. I mean, I know that, and I'll just I'll be brief here. I know that Nosy Bren had an account, and you know she's been trying to get her original account back for forever. And I know what happened, and, and literally, it was nothing. It was literally nothing. And, I mean, even the words were nothing. And but whoever reported her account, and they they took it, they blocked it, and they won't let her have it back. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. But anyway, uh, the the safety team or whatever, it, it it's pretty strict. So. From by and large, from what I've seen, it's pretty much calmed down. Used to Twitter was, it could be bad. It could be bad, really bad. So anyway, without uh, without going any further, than that anybody is interested, check out X or whatever, and um, be entertained. Jump in and join in the conversation if you ch so choose. Anyway, let's move on here. Uh, let's get into the lawyers. We got Glenn and uh, Kelly and Glenn, and of course uh, Cavelli. Bascom and uh, Pollen and Mayer. Um, Susan's not here, so I'm probably going to have to do a, this a little bit differently. I, uh, Doc, I know you probably can't read. Um, any, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I can't I, see the text. I, 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 I know you. I know you. I blow it up <laughs> as big as I can get it on the screen, but I, I know it's yeah. difficult. So I'm not going to. Be, I'll be all in. I know you would. So um, I'm going to do, um, Sheree, if you don't mind reading one of the bigger parts. Well, you can. Yes, what, whatever you need. Okay. All right, so I'll be Covelli and Bascom. And Jay, if you can be uh, Pollen and Mayor. Can you do that, Jay? Sorry, I hadn't moved it. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Pollen and mayor for yep. me. Yep. And then, uh, Rhonda, if uh, if you could be Glenn and Cherie, if you could be Kelly. I'm sorry, Kelly. Peterson. Good old Ken. Yeah, sure. Do you want me to do both the uh, yes, Glenn and yes, Kelly? please. Okay. Yeah. And it, it yeah. And as far as I know, that's it. There, there didn't be, appear to be any other lawyer present, so I think we've got everything covered. So, um, 
Hold on just a second. I'm going to back this up just a little bit right here. Uh, remember, we've got virtually all of these exhibits. They're not labeled as exhibits, but we've got them. Because remember, Amy Lehman and Deb Strauss interviewed these people like a, a year, like a year and a half prior. So Glenn and Kelly came in armed with their DOJ, uh, th these statements that they gave. We've got those reports. Virtually, as far as I know, we've got virtually, we've got them all. Um, might not have that memo right there, but I'm, I'm, unless it's the Doug Jones memo, it could be. So, alrighty. Um, Rhonda, start off whenever you're ready. This is uh, Glenn. Okay. Sheriff Peterson, we've met before, but just to remind you, my name is Steve Glenn. I'll be asking you some questions. I'll first take you through some background, then we'll cover a few specific times in history, okay? One back in the 1985 time range, one in the 1995 time range, and then we'll be moving to more current things. If you don't understand any of the questions that I'm asking, I'm sure you'll let me know. Fair enough? Yes. Okay. Let's start out with the easy. How do you spell your last name? Does it end up with an E-N or an O-N? It's P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N. Okay. It shows up different ways in different documents. That's why That's correct. I was asking. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your educational background? Well, I was born and raised in Manitowoc, educated local parochial school, graduated Lincoln High School in 67, Lakeshore Technical College in 69 with an associate degree in marketing. In 1988, I graduated from Mount Scenario College with a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice. Okay, so when did you get interested in law enforcement work? The early 70s. And did you become employed in law enforcement around then? Yes, 1975, May 15th. And what did you do then? I was hired by Manitowoc County as a traffic officer. Okay. So that was at a time, if I recall correctly, when the traffic section was separate from the Sheriff's Department. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And refresh me, please. When did they merge? January of 1979. Okay. And in January of 79, did you go along with the merger? I mean, did you stay a member of that law enforcement unit? Yes. And were you still involved with traffic or did your duties change at some point? No, basically we did the same thing. Our titles just changed. Okay. Is there a point when your job description and duties changed from traffic? I would say in 1979, primarily a traffic officer handled on-road complaints. We responded to criminal However, once the situation was stabilized, then a sheriff's department detective would take over. Okay. And you're obviously now the sheriff. Correct. When did you become sheriff? In 2001, I was sworn in. Up to 2001, was your background staying in the, what I guess I would call the traffic portion of the sheriff's department? No. When did you change from that? In 1982, I was promoted to sergeant on patrol. I stayed in that capacity through 87. In 88, I became deputy inspector of operations and I oversaw the patrol division and the detective division. And then in 89, I was promoted to inspector and under sheriff. And that position I held until I was elected sheriff. Okay. Are you married, sir? Yes. To whom? Pardon? To whom? My wife, Mary. Okay. Is she involved in law enforcement at all? No. Do you have siblings? Yes, three. Any of them involved in law enforcement? 
My daughter is a security sergeant for the University of Washington Medical College. Okay. Brothers or sisters in law enforcement? Oh, yes. I, I have one that's a reserve deputy. And who is that? Is it Keith? Keith. Okay. And Keith is married to whom? Brenda Peterson. And that's the same Brenda Peterson who worked in the victim witness unit in the district attorney's office, correct? That's correct. Okay. As a general matter, do you socialize much with Keith? No. Are you guys over at each other's houses very often? No. Okay. How about discussions with Brenda? Are those common or were those common back in, say, the period from 1985 to, I don't know, to 2003? No. Why not? I mean, I don't want to get into personal stuff. Oh. But, I mean, is it just... Is it just a matter that it just simply doesn't happen? No, you know, since they've been married, I think I've been to their house three times. I think they've been married about four or five years. So we just don't socialize that much. Sorry. Yeah, okay. And I don't have much... Fair, that's fair enough. I don't dislike them or anything. I just don't have any. It it just doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. With respect to on the job time, would you run into Brenda Peterson in connection with your job? Very rare. And can you give me a time and frequency rate of that? I mean, are we talking about once every couple of years or once every couple of weeks? Probably about once every two years. Okay. All right. Well, let me just take you back to, say, let's start in July of 1985. As I understand what you've told me up to this point, you would have been involved as a sergeant. You would have been involved still with patrol. Is that true? That's correct. Okay. And as a sergeant with patrol responsibilities, would you have had anything to do with the operation of the jail? No. Did you have, have familiar, familiarity with how the jail was operated, whether it was within your duties or not? Basically, yes. Okay. How about transportation of people arrested and taking people who have been arrested into the jail setting? Would you do that occasionally? Yes. Would you have an opportunity to observe how it is that a person is booked in and a record made of that person's booking into jail? Yes. Can you describe that for us, please? This is in the old setting back in 85. Yes, please. They would be brought up to the second floor on the elevator that would have come right directly down from the Sally Port, the North Garage. Once at the booking counter, they would have done everything, you know, paper, manual, ask questions, and write everything down. There was no computer entry or anything on that order. And, of course, they asked the usual questions like name, date of birth. Sure. Religion, next of kin, where you work, insurance, that type of thing. And from there, they would go to photo and prints and then holding for the first 12 hours and then into the cell block after. Part of the process that you just described, you refer to as photo and prints. I take it that means what might commonly be called a mugshot, a front and a profile view of the offender? Correct. And do you know what happened in terms of the storage of those photographs? There was a file system up in the photo room that's all I know. And they sat in folders, or not in folders, but... Holder, holders of some sort? Like envelopes, envelopes of some sort. Okay. It sounds as though that was not anything that was ever within your responsibility. Is that correct? No, no. 
That is, you didn't take the photographs, you didn't store the photographs, you didn't organize the photographs. No. All true? No. Correct. Okay. Do you recall whether or not you had any involvement at all in the arrest of Stephen Avery or the gathering of evidence in his case or the processing of evidence in his case? In short, any involvement at all in the case of Stephen Avery in which he was charged with a sexual assault of Penny Berenson back in July of 1985? I believe, yes. Okay. And obviously I was asking multiple questions there and trying to be broad because I just want, I just wanted to cover the area first. Can you break out of, can you break out for me your involvement and start if you can with the earliest involvement and take me right on through all of it? You mean leading up to the arrest or the arrest? All of it. Okay, that evening, I would have received a phone call from Sheriff Kosurik informing me to arrest Steve Avery to see if he was at home and arrest him for attempted first degree homicide. Okay. As the shift commander, I would have enlisted the help of other patrol officers. I contacted James Freilich and Mike Bushman, and then I did make a call to Ireland Avery to make sure Steve still lived where I thought he lived. And Ireland had some concerns, so he asked us if we'd meet at his house and talk to him. So we did. And Arlen expressed concern that if Steve resisted, there would be, you know, somebody would get hurt. And he asked if I would let him come along so that he could try and talk to Steve so that, you know, everything would go smoothly. Let me interrupt you there. Right. Okay. And I think it'll probably be easier if we take this sort of chunk by chunk Sure. As we're as we're going along. Let's start out with the telephone call from Sheriff Kasarek. Can you tell me what you recall of him? What he said to you? Just that I was to go and check Stephen Avery's residence and if he was there to arrest him for attempted first degree homicide. That's all I recall. Did he tell you of uh, whom or what the case involved? Did he tell you it involved, for example, a sexual assault? Did he mention no, no, the Berenson name? Do you recall? I don't know. I should have. I don't know for sure, but I should have known that from the afternoon shift. Okay. And tell me why you say that. That is why you should have known that. Because the prior shift commander would tell me what took place on the afternoon shift. And that would be because of your position as sergeant on patrol? Right, right. So do you have any recollection as to the time of day, roughly, when you got the call from Sheriff Kosarek? Oh, somewhere between 8.30 and 9.30, somewhere in there. In the evening? Yes. And were you still on duty then, or were you at home? Yes, I started about 8 p.m. Started at 8 p.m., okay. So do you know where you were physically? No, don't recall. Don't know if you were out in a car somewhere else as opposed to at the sheriff's department, for example? Correct. But at some point, you do get this call. Does he tell you anything about any other officers that are involved or anything that he particularly wants done except the arrest of Mr. Avery? I mean, is he asking you to gather evidence? Is he asking you to look for any particular evidence? Mr. Pollen, in that call? In that call? No, not that I'm aware of. All right. And again, I mean, the he's not asking you, for example, to gather photographs, I take it. No. Did you ever have anything to do with gathering photographs from the jail for a photo show up in this case? No. Did you ever hear anything about anybody who did have that obligation? No. So as you sit here today, you have no knowledge as to who it is who gathered photographs, if that's what happened, from the jail to prepare a photo show up for the victim in this case. I would have no idea. Okay. 
when you decide that you need to get some other officers to help, you mentioned James Freilich. 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 Could you spell that, please? F R O E L I C H. Okay. And you named one other officer, and my writing is so bad, I can't even read what I wrote down. Michael Bushman. Bushman. Uh, it, I guess that looks like Bushman on my page. Uh, are these other people in the patrol division? They were, yes. And any special reason you'd choose them? No. Just people that were available? Yes. And again, you say you decided to get in touch with Arlen Avery. And for the record, Arlen Avery was also associated with the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, correct? Yes, he was also a patrolman on the night shift. And you knew him, obviously. Oh, yes. And you also knew him to be a relative of Stephen Avery. Yes. And that's the reason that you called him. Right. So you had taken us through going over and talking to him and concerns expressed about not wanting anybody to get hurt in this process. And so you made a decision that it would make sense to have Arla Avery come along. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, all right. Uh, can you go ahead and pick it up from there? Okay. We did proceed to Steve's house, which would have been north of where Ireland had been living. Mike Bushman was a canine officer, so he was went to the west side of the residence. Jim Fralick would have accompanied Arlen to the door, which I believe was on the east side of the house. And I stood off to the, well, what I would call it, the northeast. And then we would have a view of all four sides between us. I know Arlen knocked on the door and somebody asked who it was. Let me interrupt you because... I'm not going to I'm not going to take you through all of the details okay. of, of that arrest. I mean, was there were there any other law enforcement folks there that No. Besides the folks you've identified? No. In particular, was Judy Dvorak at the house at any time when you were there? No. And the arrest of Mr. Avery occurred? Yes. He was taken into custody and, excuse me, and taken to the jail. Is that correct? That's correct. Were you, excuse me, were you with him when he was taken to the jail? I took him to the jail. You did it personally? Yes. And so the process that you described earlier about what happens when somebody is taken to the jail under arrest is that the process that was followed then? Yes. Photograph taken of Mr. Avery at that time? Not while I was there. Okay. At what point did you turn him over to the jail people and go somewhere else? We had to collect hair, pubic hair samples and combings, and I did that and processed that. And after that, I left and they finished the booking process. Okay. Okay. When you say you had to collect these, yeah, who told you to do that? That would have come from the sheriff at some point also. Were you in, that sort of gives rise to the next group of questions. Were you in contact with the sheriff from the time of the original call to go make the arrest until the time that you brought Mr. Avery to the jail? No. No communication in either direction? Not that I recall. Okay. How about communication by him with anyone else that was part of your team and no. the sheriff's directions being conveyed to you? No. So when's the next time you talked to the sheriff or someone else talked to the sheriff and conveyed his comments to you? I don't recall specifically. But it obviously was sometime in connection with it, with the jail for the obtaining of the yes of the hair samples, right? Yes. Do you recall the converse that conversation, or do you just simply know it must have happened because you know you gathered samples? 
it would would have happened if it, it had happened otherwise i wouldn't have gathered samples okay are you again i don't want to be too picky about this but i'm trying to nail down the sheriff versus someone else do you know that that direction would have come from Sheriff Kucerich as opposed to, for example, I don't know, Couché or anybody else that was involved? That night, the only person I had any contact with was the sheriff. There was no one else that I was aware of. I'm going to pause right here. This is uh, line seven. I'm going to pause right here because we've covered a number of, uh, I, I'm not going to call them uh, big cans of worms or anything, but. You know, uh, he's he he's trying to pull out of Peterson. He uh, one of the first things he talked about was who got the photos from the jail and took them to Kasurik. And that's been kind of a it was it's been kind of a bigger point of contention of anyone that was associated because um, as I recall that they can't entirely nail this completely down, but you know, there was testimony that, you know, about a, a pretty thick stack of photographs was brought to Kasurik and he pocketed them. And then, of course, we have that one photograph as, uh, remember, guys, it says do not throw away or uh, had some writing on the back of it. Doc, I know you remember that because we talked about that um, kind of at length. It was written on the back of that. Yeah, written on the back of that photograph. Do not throw away or whatever um so there's some elements of these jail photographs that are in question plus apparently there was um at least one booking photo that disappeared we've, we've never been able to find it it's never been located and as people let's just say uh somebody that's kind of a an on and off guest at the jail uh, if they get arrested and June of 85, they get booked in, photo taken. They get out, they go commit some other crime, they get booked in, photograph taken. The booking photo gets updated. Right. As to what happens to the prior photos is also in question. So anyway, that's one point. And then, of course, um, another point that we, and we just talked about this one um, it, what's actually in the deposition about Judy Dvorak going and talking to this Ramona Marcel and telling her, you know, about being involved in this arrest of Stephen Avery. And she basically told her she was, according to Ramona, Dvorak said she wasn't, and now Peterson said she wasn't there either. So there's some weird shit going on there. I, you know, clearly someone is not telling the full truth. Or the truth at all. Somebody's lying, yeah, but I. But it makes me wonder what, uh, what, what, what purpose would Marcel have had in lying? Yeah, I, I don't know, um, I, and I, I don't disagree with you. I, I don't. Um, okay. Interestingly enough, and and we'll get to it. Uh, I think it's the. I've actually got it pulled up. The next time we get into depositions, we're going to be getting into. Uh, Larry Conrad's deposition and this Ramona, Ramona Marcel does pl come into his deposition as well. So that's for later. Okay. That's for later on. Anyway, um, Glenn has also mentioned, um, mind this, oh, Bushman, Bushman's involvement in this. Mm -hmm. And yeah. well, there's a lot, there's things going on, obviously, in the 2005 case that he was involved. Of course, he didn't generate any reports, but. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Right, right. So, and can then you there's. Imagine how much different this case, sorry. Can you imagine no, no, how ahead. much different this case might be if everyone who was involved, even in the most. 85, um, 80, 85 yeah, it, time frame. Yeah, or, or yeah, um, or at any, yeah, I guess the 85 pretty much. If they, if they had all written a report the way they're supposed to, yeah. <laughs> truthfully, this could, this whole case could look a whole lot different too. It, it could. I mean, if they were just written reports at all, some at kind all. of right. reporting of their activities, you know, it, 
Yeah. But you know, once a, a police officer makes an official report, then you know it, it's it, 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 well, it, it it can change it changes everything. So because now they're committed, that, you know, to a path. Um, another thing that was also mentioned early on was Ben Peterson, which is uh, Keith Peterson's uh, wife, and of course her deposition is the longest deposition. I mean, not counting two parters. I'm talking about single deposition. It was basically a, an all day event. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was really long. I, I know we did, we had to split it up into two or three sections to get it all completed. So, uh, and you know, her, her, her testimony was pretty interesting. Um, everything that she had to say. So I'm, I'm, I'm not shocked that, you know, Glenn and Kelly would want to, uh, understand any relationship between Kenneth Peterson and his cousin and, and, uh, uh Brenda Peterson, his wife. So, uh, his brother. I thought it was his brother. No, it was cousin. No, it was cousin. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's his cousin. And um, Brenda Peterson is obviously his wife. So, um, but, you know, because uh, our Peterson, uh, Sheriff Peterson said, no, they didn't really associate much uh, socially. So that's what he says. Yeah. You never, I mean, they, they, and that very well could be true, but you just never know what is said at, at the office. You, you just All don't right. know. And I'm not trying to make any innuendo. I'm just saying that is a matter of any job, any job. It doesn't matter if it's the sheriff's office. It, it, I don't care. So. Right. Well, I, we, uh, we have that same question with, um, in Daniel's case, with Rocky Gregory, who was the son-in-law of the yep. crime lab analyst that, that yep. did the forensic testing on Daniel's uniform pants. Yeah, that was they swear up and down. They never was, talked about it outside. Of, <laughs> yeah. Right. That was Gilchrist, right? No, that was uh, no, Elaine Taylor. Elaine Taylor, not Gilchrist. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Sorry. He was Gilchrist's yeah. protege. So. Yeah. 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 Gilchrist 2.0. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Sorry. No, 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 you're fine. Um, you know, it, and again, and we'll probably, I'm sure we'll talk about this more as we get closer to the end here. This is all leading up to getting Kasorik and then Vogel, uh, getting their testimony, which, you know, after reading through all these, and several of them uh, multiple times, understanding the length that they would go to to keep Kasorik off that stand. Because, you know, if, he, if he's forced to testify, it, it would be really risky. And I think they knew at that point in time that Glenn and Kelly were had things in hand and not knowing everything that they probably had. These are just depositions. There's no I, I know there's a discovery phase, but, I, you know, I think they knew that they had these reports and so forth. But a real risk for them to, uh, I think, personally, to have. For Kasark to have gotten on that stand, and I'm sorry, I I just see it that way. I could be completely wrong. I admit that, but this lawsuit was going badly for the county, mm -hmm. and they knew it. They knew it. Yeah. Um. Okay. I think that's the, I think that's the major points that we've gotten to so far. I I just wanted to stop so you know just to emphasize that a little bit. Um. Jay or, or Doc, do you guys, or Cherie, do you guys have anything you want to add before we move on? Doc may have had to step away. Um, no, I'm fine at the moment. I'm fine. Okay, good. I do just want to remind everybody in chat that um, if you have a question, like Millie has put a cue in front of her question, and so we'll put a star, Jack or I will star that question, and at the end... Yep. We'll address them. We'll address all of your questions at the end. So we're not Absolutely. ignoring you. <laughs> Just going to wait till the end. I have seen a few new names that's popped in. Uh, James Crane. Oh. Hello. Hugh Frazier. I think I'm not sure Millie was here. Oh, Scooby. Myra hey, Scooby. Yeah. Yep. Myra. T1. Oh, my God. Guys. Oh, I know. <laughs> Jamie Hart. <laughs> Jamie. Hey, license plate. Uh, and T, yeah. you know, I, you know, I, I know it's really difficult, but you know, uh, you, you're really chatty. So, you know, let other people talk a little bit. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to answer this question right now. I'm going to go ahead and pop it on here. Didn't Bushman come out of retirement on to search the every salvage yard? Wasn't that strange? Uh, he wasn't retired. Uh, com- I, I think there was some kind of, I'm certain, I feel certain he had slowed down, but I wouldn't say he was completely retired. He was a reserve deputy with MTSO. Reserve deputies, um, they are called, you know, if they are, you know, let's just say there was an event in town and they needed to help with parking, the sheriff's department, uh, other type of extraneous uh, events that doesn't happen very often. So they're, these folks are uh, trained. They don't work necessarily full time or on a daily basis. They get called and say, hey, we need some help doing blah, blah, blah. So I guess, you know, um, there was uh, somewhat of a semi retirement, but he wasn't completely. He didn't necessarily just come out of retirement. That's kind of a misconception that we found out later on. I hope that clears that up and I didn't make it worse. That no. that, that that sound OK? Yeah, that sounded great to me. Uh, but there's yeah. a, a kind of a follow up to that by Millie. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, she asked, wasn't that the day that all of the evidence was found on ASY? Well, Bushman was really involved in the Cuss Road um, search team A. And search team A, there was several. It was uh, Bushman, Jost, uh, Siders. Uh, I can't remember all the names. Search team A started in the Redont pit, and they had permission to search there from uh, Redont. From the point that they started at, they began and they walked towards the Cuss Road cul-de-sac. Now, they had permission to search, like I said, the Redont pit, but they did not have, or the Redont quarry, um, but they did not have permission once they breached the property line and went into that wooded area. So, uh, that's really where he was. Bushman really wasn't involved uh, at the salvage yard, you know, November 8th when, you know, Joe jo, uh, allegedly found the, this bone eight feet south of the burn pit. So important that they didn't even photograph it. I'm not even entirely sure they collected it. And, you know, everything went to hell in a handbasket on that day. In fact, Joe didn't even want credit for his major discovery. And I know it's downplayed and not really thought about, but these are the kinds of things that get a line cop, a gold badge. Being, right. you know, noticing something like that, this detail, uh, this, and it's case changing. It's this was these were this was just as important. Uh, well, it's right there with it, as important as that RAV4. I'm sorry, it is this major discovery that was so important that they didn't do anything but running with shovels and, you know, uh, uh, screens to shake out whatever they could find in this, allegedly found in, in the burn pit, but didn't photograph any of it, didn't video any of it, nothing. And Joe, again, he didn't want credit. In fact, he kind of ran the other way from it. In fact, it was so unimportant that his, well, I won't say his direct supervisor, but certainly... Somebody up the food chain, which was Deputy Inspector, um, I just, my mind, uh, um, um, my mind just went blank. Help me out here, guys. Um, huh. uh, I'm bad with the names. Say, now start your sentence over again. It was so unimportant oh, that right, right, right. he ran, yeah, that he didn't uh, report. His Deputy yeah. Inspector, I'll find the name anyway. Is it he didn't know. No, Sturdivant's oh. DCI. I'll think of it here in a minute. But nonetheless, this guy was out at the salvage yard every day. He didn't know for three days that it was Yost that made this discovery. Three days. One of his own officers. Yeah. So, anyway, that, right? I've, I've got off on a, on a tangent. I apologize that I get ramped up and I start talking about that damn burn pit. Because... <laughs> I, uh, I just see so I see so much. I, it is I see so much wrong um, of how it was handled. It, it really irritates me. So 
it was, you know, it was really, from the reports we have, it was really the 8th was the Bonanza Day. The key got found later, but Bushman wasn't involved in any of that. He was at Cuss Road on the 7th. He's the one that radioed in that we have the radio call for the investigators to come down. They got some items of evidence, blah, 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 some items that need to be looked at. And then it was a pause for 10 sec, five seconds. And he comes back and says, and you better bring a shovel or something of that nature. So yeah. it's a pretty big deal. I remember that very specifically, bring a shovel. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, I just want to uh, say before we start, so just because now I'm just like super curious because I it really did stick out to me at the time. Uh, Stuart yeah. King says, I'm sure Ken P said Keith P was his brother at the start of the deposition. And I, I, I'm not saying you're wrong, Jack. I'm just saying that's how I remember it, too, because I was thinking, wow, your brother and you didn't see him for years. That's kind of weird. So I don't know. I, I, I maybe me and Stuart are way off base, but that's how I remembered it too. Uh, well, I, I could we'll be wrong. About to check later. Well, I, I could be wrong. It's I, not I would, that yeah, I think I would, you're wrong about the relationship, but I feel like that's how it was said in the deposition. But we'll check yeah, that would be weird. that would be strange that if he didn't really associate with his brother for that very yeah. that often, unless there was a tiff between them. Right. That's why I was, I remember when I was reading that part, I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting that, you know, he wouldn't see his own brother for so long. Exactly. But... exactly. And anyway. technical difficulties. Uh, it. Uh, I remembered while you were talking, this deputy inspector, Greg Shedder, that is his name. That was, you know, uh, MTSO. Uh, that was Jason just, uh, well, up the food chain boss. I'm guessing there's at least one other person uh, in the direct line that was just that reported to directly, and it wasn't necessarily Shedder. But he still would have should have known that it was Joseph that found this, made this discovery. I mean, my God. We'll check it though. I, I just, I maybe I just remembered it wrong, and I would have think that you know if they if he had said brother. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know. I if he, it, it, if he, I if he, if he, did, if he just said brother, yeah, if he just said brother, it just seemed me, and you didn't associate with your own brother for you know every couple of years. Yeah. I guess it could happen. It does happen. I'm sure, but we'll check it. Make just to make sure. I want to be right. Yeah. I, want us to get yeah, I just yeah. Just we'll, yeah, we'll go back later and check it out for sure. Absolutely. Okay. All righty. Let's, uh, let, let's get back to it if everybody's ready to go. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me get Line seven. Here. Yep. Okay. Did you ever go to the hospital where Miss Benson was? No. While she was there? No. Were you ever there while the sheriff was there? No. That night... That is the night of July 29th or the morning of the 30th. Were you ever at the hospital? No. Okay. After you've turned Mr. Avery over to the jailers, what's the next thing you had to do in connection with this case? I, I would go downstairs and dictate my report as to what took place. And you did that? Yes. And that's done on what kind of system back in 85, do you know? Those handheld recorders. And then you just turn a tape over to somebody for trans transcription? To the secretary that does the transcribing, yes. Okay. After that, what did you do? I would have gone back on patrol. Anything else to do with the Avery case? I testified at his trial. That was all. About the arrest? Yes. I'm sorry? I test, yeah, I testified about the arrest. At the, at the trial, and that was all? Yes? Yes. Oh. Having, oh, whoops. Well, I, well, you guys <laughs> no, got backwards sorry, here. Sorry, that was, yeah. <laughs> sorry. You say, say right. Ronda. Right. 
at the trial and that was all? Yes. Yes. Having looked at your trial testimony transcript, I didn't see much beyond the arrest. Is that a fair statement in terms of your involvement in this case? That's correct. Did you have anything to do with execution of the search warrant? No. And you weren't involved in a lineup? No. Uh, let's see. Okay. Now let's talk about instead of your own involvement in the, in the case, your conversation with others concerning the case back in the time frame of, well, let's say late July of 1985 through the trial and sentencing into early 86. Obviously, you would have had some conversation with people in the district attorney's office in preparation for testimony on the case, true? I don't recall talking to them at all. Really? Yeah. I mean, you think you just got put on the stand cold? I don't know. I just don't remember talking to them at all. All right. I take it you have testified and had testified in a courtroom prior to 1985 in your yes, yes. position as a law enforcement officer, correct? Yes. And was it typically the practice of Mr. Vogel at the time to have a preparation session with a witness? Mr. Mayor, form of the question and foundation. Uh, can I, I have to take a second really quick. I'm so sorry. That's right. It's okay. I'll, I'll read for you. Line 24. Uh, you can answer. Okay. Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. So. It would depend on the case. But as you're sitting here today, you just don't have any recollection of conversations with Mr. Vogel about this case. Yeah. I don't have any recollection recollection of meeting with him on any subject that is associated with this case right right that was not a good question let me try to narrow it down a little bit you didn't talk to him in any you didn't talk to him in any effort to prepare you as a witness for your testimony in the trial correct no i don't know yeah at least you don't recall i don't recall it and you also don't recall, and this is part, um, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding. You also don't recall any other conversations with District Attorney Vogel on any other uh, aspect of the Avery Bernstein case. Is that true? That's correct. Okay. Now, how about Sheriff Kosorek? Did you have conversations with him uh, uh, concerning the, well, I'm going to refer to it as the Avery case, but it, it's the one that we've been discussing. In what time frame? Well, right now I'm limiting it uh, to the uh, up to the time of sentencing, so 1985 into early 1985 into early 1986. Other than you know the report that I dictated and came, you know, was presented to him. No, nothing more than that. I'm back, Jack. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. No, no problem at all. When you say it was presented to him, was that because he was essentially acting as the lead officer on the case? Or was it presented to him simply because he was sheriff and all reports went by, sheriff, by the sheriff? No, it was because he was the investigator. And based on your own experience in that department, was that a common occurrence for the sheriff to be the lead investigator? Mr. Mayor, form of the question. Occasionally. Can you give me an estimate as to how many times prior to the Avery case you had seen Mr. Kucerich act as a chief investigator? There were just a few times, no more than three. But you think there was some times prior to that case when that occurred? Yeah, I was only there, you know, eight hours a day. Right. You know, so what he did in those other hours, I don't know. But again, are you able to identify those cases for me in any way? No, not off the top of my head, I can't. 
Is there something that you have access to that would refresh your recollection as to what those cases were and in particular when they were? Not that I'm aware of. Did it strike you as unusual for the chief investigator on the case to be Mr. Kosarek? I think due to his detective background with the city, he involved himself more. Normally, in my, if I was to compare himself to myself, I wouldn't be involved. The, make sure I understand this. It was not common. It was instead rare for him to be involved as chief investigator of a crime investigation prior to July 1985. Is that correct? That I don't know. You mean rare? Yeah, I think that's a term you used. Yeah, I would say rare. Okay, but you do have a recollection that it happened and it could have happened two or three times? That's pause, yes. Prior to July of 1985? Yes. But you can't remember the names of the cases or the particulars of any cases? That's correct. I mean, let's stop right here. Just for one, just one second. I promise we won't just, this is just a, an add in. And as far as I can remember about any of the prior officers, any, anyone then involved in MTSO or whatever, no one remembers Cassart being involved in other cases. As far as I can remember, only Peterson. Now he says he thinks two or three, but he doesn't remember any of them. Cases <laughs> but nothing yet. specific. Yeah. <laughs> no. Right. Of course. Sounds yeah, about and, right. And Well, you know, I, I haven't specifically tried to do any digging as to what other cases he may have been directly involved in as sheriff. But I think it, it, it was would be in most jurisdictions. It's really unusual for the sheriff to be neck deep involved in an investigation. Not to say he wouldn't be disconnected from it at all, but to, to lead the investigation. No, no, it's just right. no. anyway. Um, line seven, continue on. Can you tell me anything about the types of cases? I mean, were, were they crimes of violence as opposed to white collar fraud types of crimes or forgery kinds of crimes? No. Any distinguishing factors about him? No, he would, I think, depending on what he was doing at the time, you know, he'd pick and choose. And that's just based on your own observations. Right. That's not based on a conversation with him? I know, you know, I know sheriffs today that will, that'll do the same thing. Sure. But I know others that, you know, have a total hands off, but you know, that's a personal prerogative. And in 1985, did you have any conversation with Sheriff Kosarek as to why it is that he was involved in the Avery Berenson case? No. So he never expressed to you a reason for being involved in it? No. Let me move the time frame up a little bit and let's go into the 1995-1996 range. You are aware, are you not, that there were post-conviction efforts brought by Mr. Avery? Yes. And that among the and that and that among the issues raised in the post conviction motions was the possibility that some other person than he had been involved in the offense and in particular a person identified at that stage anyway only as someone coming from Sheboygan. You know about that? No. Are you aware of officers in the sheriff's department? You were sheriff by then, right? No. When, I, I'm sorry. 2000. Excuse me. Um, in nine. 2000, I was elected, took office in 2001. Yeah. In 95, 96, what was your role? I was the, in, were you under sheriff then? The inspector and under sheriff. Okay. And in that role, you were essentially second in command of the department. Is that true? Correct. You know a detective named Couchet? Yes. 
Were you aware that Detective Couchet was gathering statements from a number of other detectives concerning their knowledge of a Sheboygan County suspect in the Avery matter? No. Did you have any involvement in the post-conviction investigations that were going on in 95 or 96 about the Avery case? No. In particular, I'm going to jump ahead, but I'll come back to 95. You recall in 2003 when you are sheriff learning that there had been contact with your sheriff's department by another law enforcement agency, probably the Brown County Sheriff's Department, concerning a person who had been arrested by that other law enforcement agency and contact is contacting your agency. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I believe so. Okay. And this is at some stage gets to involve a couple of other couple of other deputies, I'm sorry. Yeah, a couple of other deputies who made written statements about their contact. Correct. Back in 1985. And they made those attachments in 2003, correct? I believe so. And I just want you, with that in mind, to let me know whether you had any knowledge of that going on in 1995. No. Are you aware of ever hearing anybody discuss that in 1995? No. Now, you've seen, I take it, well, let me just show you what's been marked in this case is Exhibit 124, and just ask you to take a moment and read that over. Okay. And may I also show you what were, what were marked earlier in this is Exhibit 125 and another document that has not yet been marked as an exhibit, which I'll give to the reporter. And what does that state? Exhibit 138, it'll be 138, and it'll be Bates 5250, and it's the statement of Andrew Colburn. Okay. And Sheriff, I'm going to also give you what we've just had marked as Exhibit 138, ask you to take a quick look at that. Okay. You recognize Exhibit 124 as a memo prepared by Doug Jones, an assistant DA? I'm going to object, Foundation. I mean, it is what it is. That's what it says. Is that what you recognize that as? It would appear so. Okay. When's the first time you saw this memo? Right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, you say so. <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> oh, I know you do, scoundrel. <laughs> okay, so let's turn to 125. What do you recognize that as being? That's one of the Sheriff's Department statement forms, and it looks like James Link's signature on it. Okay, and have you seen this document before? No. <laughs> Pardon me while I choke on my own spit. <laughs> okay, and how about 138, which is the, well, you tell me what it is. Yeah, that's another one of our statement forms. Looks like it was filled out by Andrew Colburn. And again, have you seen that document before today? No. Okay, the documents that you've looked at here, 138, 125, 124, all relate to the same matter, do they not? I believe so. I mean, you've seen them now. Yes. And that and that matter has to do with the subject that we were discussing very briefly a few minutes ago. That is a telephone call coming into the sheriff's department from a detective employed by a law enforcement agency outside Manitowoc, correct? Correct. And that was in the 95 general time range. I believe so. As reflected in these documents. Yes. Now you had a com you had conversations in 2003 about that subject, did you not? Right. And you talked at the time with Sergeant Colburn. Yes. And you talked at the time with the is it just Deputy Lane? Lieutenant Link. 
Lieutenant Link, I'm sorry. Yes. And they told you about these events that had occurred in 1995 as they recalled them, correct? Yes. Do you remember who else was involved in those conversations between you and, well, let's start with Mr. Colburn. No, I believe both Andy Colburn and James Link came to my office at the same time. And with no one else? Correct. And you were with no one else? Correct. So it was just the three of you? Yes. Okay. And you had talked about this matter of the 1995 telephone contact from an outside agency to, pardon me, to the Manitowoc County Sheriff, correct? Yes. And what did they tell you? Let's start with Sergeant Colburn. What did he tell you had occurred? He said when he was working at the jail, he had received a phone call, I believe from a detective in Brown County, that he had a suspect who said that he had assaulted a person in Manitowoc County and somebody else was in prison. And that's about it. He said he referred it to a detective and heard nothing of it after that. And I take it that that was something that you consider to be significant material, correct? Yes form of the question. You recognize that if in fact the, the statement that was being reported by the detective in Brown County was accurate, that someone may have been wrongfully convicted of something in Manitowoc County, correct? Correct. Mr. Covelli, objection calls uh, no foundation. You also recognize that since neither, well, since Let's just deal with Sergeant Colburn. Since Sergeant Colburn had not memorialized that telephone call in any way, that that is, he had not prepared a report concerning it, that he should now attempt to do that, correct? I did tell him to fill out a statement, and we put it in with the case file. And you directed him to prepare a written report, right? Yes. And do you believe that Exhibit 138 is that report? Yes. Have you seen any other report from Sergeant Culber relating to the matter that we've been discussing? That is the 1995 call? No, I haven't. So again, that's, I take it, a reason that you believe that Exhibit 138 is that report? Correct. And it was more than just a prepare the report. You wanted the report to be given back to you, correct? Not to me personally, it would, at that point in the time, it would be stored in a vault and it would have to go back into that vault. Okay. Where is this vault? First floor, right off the secretarial offices. And is that a vault to which you have access? Oh, yes. And is it a vault to which others have access? Yes. Who are the others that have access to that vault? Bill Beck, the records custodian, and Kathy Leist, the business operations manager. Okay, for purposes of sort of punctuation here, is that Bill Beck, comma, who is the records custodian? Yes. Okay, and this woman whose name you gave us, who is, what's her position again? She's the business operations manager. And what does she have to do with the vault? Well, the vault holds a number of things, you know, some personal fi personnel files from separated employees, that type of thing. And financial records of the department, that kind of thing. Sure. And tapes from different county departments that are stored in two locations, that type of stuff. Okay. So... Other than the three of you, that is this person dealing with operations, this person dealing with, is it Beck? Yes. And yourself, is there anybody else that has access to the safe? The undersheriff. Okay. Anybody else? No, not that I believe. So it would have had to have been one of those four persons that would have received Sergeant Colbert's report to put it into the vault? Correct. Do you recall whether that was you? No. 
That is, you don't recall. I know. Or you know it was not you. No, I don't recall. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it may, <laughs> it's just weird. Anyway, so it may have been you is, I guess, what you're saying. Um, no, I don't. I, I lost my place. I'm sorry. Line 13. Line 13. Okay. It could have been. Uh, and if I were to ask you the same series of questions about Lieutenant Lang's report, would your answers be the same? Correct. That is, uh-oh, I hear your puppy. Yes. <laughs> Need some attention. Oh. <laughs> That is, Exhibit 125 appears to be in his, be his report of that event that we've been discussing. Yes. You asked him to make a report? Yes. And that report ended up in the vault? Yes. And you know it ended up in the vault because at some later point, on or about September 22nd, 2003, you were interviewed by Special Agent Deborah Strauss of the Wisconsin Division of Criminal Investigation, correct? I wasn't in interviewed by her. Well, let me, let me get this marked. I've seen that. They haven't, they never interviewed me. They didn't? No. Okay. They did talk to me. Oh, dickhole. Okay. Sorry. And they informed me that they were do what they were doing and asked for a report. Fair enough. But no, but no interview. Get this. Okay, let me show you what's been marked. Sure. As exhibit 139. And can you tell us what that is? It looks like notes from Deborah Strauss and yeah, yeah Deborah Strauss. And have you seen that before? Yes. And when were you shown that and by whom? Yesterday, Amy Doyle. Okay. So let me grab it back. When you're meeting with Amy Doyle, is she showing you this document or did you have this document? No, she showed me. Uh, this document purports to be a memor memorial memorialization of a meeting that took place between yourself and Deborah Strauss, correct? Correct. And during that meeting, she told you certain things, correct? Yes. She asked you certain things? No, she didn't ask me anything. Well, she mostly told, she told me. She asked you for copies of documents? Yes. Okay. You said you'd be willing to produce documents? Yes. And eventually did so? Yes. And this report includes a list of the documents that you provided to her on that date, correct? I don't think it came to her on that date, no. Uh, whenever it is that you gave them to her. Correct. You went over the documents that were in the vault with her on the date reflected in the report, correct? I didn't go over them. You didn't? No. Did you take them out and show them to her then? No, the reports could have been pulled out at that point and she could have had access to look at them. However, before she, we would have had a, to copy them if she was going to take a copy. Right. Yeah. But my point is yeah. that she was allowed access to the documents in terms of being able to review them on the day that she met with you, correct? I'm not sure. Reporter changing audio tapes, excuse me. Briefly pause, please continue. If she didn't get access to them on that day, when would she have gotten access? Whenever they were copied. And what was done with the copies? They were given to her, whatever, sent to her. That you'd have to ask Bill Beck. That would have been something he did. Okay. So you went to the location 
in the sheriff's office where the vault is and remove the case file from it. Is that true? That's possible. Yes. Um, I'm lost. And indicated at the time that you would be willing to give her a copy of the documents, but you'd have to get the copies made? Correct. When you gave her copies of documents, among the documents that were provided were the statements of Mr. Lank and Mr. Colburn, correct? That I wouldn't know. You'd have to ask Bill back. Are you able to tell me what documents from the case file were kept in the vault? Specifically, no. Uh, why was a decision made to keep any part of that case file in a vault? Because we figured we'd be retrieving it more frequently. Otherwise, they're kept in the basement down in the records room. And that's farther away. When was it placed in the vault? Don't know. We'd have to talk to Bill Beck or we'd have to ask Bill Beck. So you yourself have no knowledge at all as to when that file went into the vault? No. And you yourself have no recollection of putting anything into the case file? No. Is that true? That's correct. What all do you remember as being in the case file relating to the Avery matter that was in that vault? At what time? Today. Okay. Just the investigative reports, the envelopes of hair samples that were left, statements, lab reports, that's about all. Is it your understanding that the entire case file was in the vault? I believe so, yes. That is, you had never been led to believe that there was another part of the file that was not in the vault. Is that a fair statement? Correct. Did you ever direct anybody to put anything into the vault? In the vault? Mm-hmm. The statements for one thing, yeah. There was a letter from some inmate from Brown County Correctional. I believe that went in there. Right. I don't know who, but he said that Steve admitted to admitted to the crime, and I know the sheriff had left that when he left office. Wait, what? Um, oh, sorry, I'm having my own little thoughts. Um, that is, Sheriff Kucerich had left that. Right. And left it where? There's a small safe in his former office that would have had that. Well, when you became sheriff, did you find items in the small safe in what was now your office that related to the Avery matter? Just a letter. And that's the only thing that was there? Yes. And did you then cause that letter to go from that safe to the larger safe where the whole file was kept? Yes. When's the first time you recall seeing any of that file being in the vault? After Steve was released. Had you been in the vault yourself prior to that time? Occasionally, yes. And I take it that it that at this time that at that time you did not see the file in the vault. No, I wasn't. I wasn't looking for it either. I understand, but I mean it's fairly sizable file, right? Yeah, and it's a fairly sizable vault. Yeah, that's what I'm going to get to. I mean, is the vault? you know, capable of holding multiple banker's boxes, for example? Oh, yes. Can you give me the dimensions roughly? Probably 12 feet by four, about four feet. And 12 is what depth? Length or width. Okay. And depth is about four feet. And height? About eight feet. So this is a big operation. Yes. <laughs> and do you know in what format the Avery file was kept at that stage? 
was it in boxes or plastic bags or what? It would have been in boxes, probably banker boxes. Okay. So you don't know, so you, so you don't yourself have any knowledge as to whether that file was there before Mr. Avery's exoneration in 2003 or not? No. Is that a fair statement? Correct. All right. Then since 2003, the file was maintained in the vault? Yes. At anybody's direction or just because that's where it was and it was just kept there? I think it's because of where it was and the likelihood of, you know, multiple requests on it. Now, the same day that Lieutenant Link's report is prepared, which appears to be September 12, 2003, mm -hmm. and the same day that Sergeant Colbert's report is prepared, which again appears to be September 12, 2003, is the date that you issued a memo, which I'll have marked in a moment, but that indicated that employees were to make no comments concerning the Stephen Avery case. That's correct. Correct. Uh, can you mark this, Jeff? Sure. Thanks. Okay, let me show you what's, what's marked as Exhibit 140. It's a two-sentence statement. You've seen that before, correct? Correct. Is that something you went over yesterday with Miss Doyle? No. By the way, what documents did you go over with Miss Doyle yesterday? My testimony at his trial. Anything else? Not that I'm aware of, no. Yeah. How about, how about... The other thing you showed me from... How about this DCI report? That, yeah, that would be it. it that would be it. Okay, so the only two things that you went over with her were a transcript of your trial testimony and a copy of the Exhibit 139, which is the DCI report, correct? Correct. So can you tell me the circumstances that led up to the making of 140? Court counsel advised us not to talk about any of th those things. When did that happen? That would have been about the time Steve was released. So if this it was September 12th, it would have been that day or so. The document was not prepared then in connect in any connection with all the exhibits one at all with the exhibits 125 and 138? No. Just coincidence in terms of timing? Correct. And <laughs> And did you get a written direction from the core council on that? No. Just an oral argument or just an oral comment? Right. And was this was this his decision that is the news releases are going to be issued either by you or by Inspector Herman or was that your decision? No, that would be my decision if there were any. Okay. That is, you're not suggesting that you were directed by core counsel to make that statement. No. Let's talk about other conversations concerning the Avery Bertson matter with Tom Kasser. When I asked you earlier about such conversations, you asked me what time frame, and I said, well, we were talking about then back in 1985. Now, I want you to expand that time frame to include any time. Have you had conversations about the Avery Beardson matter with Tom Kosurik? Yes. Can you tell me when and what the subject matters were? Well, the other time would have been when he was leaving office and he told me that statement was in the one safe and then after the lawsuit started. This lawsuit? Mm-hmm. That was my line, but it's fine. <laughs> oh, whoops, yes. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> we had brief conversations on it if Bergner had told him anything. And he told me that he didn't remember talking to Bergner and that Bergner he didn't recall Bergner talking to him. And that's about that's about it. There wasn't a whole lot more. Liar. You're a liar. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, I had to interject. <laughs> oh, what, don't, don't do that because I never do. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, what Cherie said, you think he's lying? <laughs> God. <laughs> So it sounds like there are two conversations after 1985 between yourself and Mr. Kosarek concerning the Avery matter. Am I right about that? Right. I think he he mentioned also about the appeals that had failed, and I think that's about all. Do you know when that statement was made about the appeals that had failed? About the same time that he had talked about the Bergner statements. And that's when he's leaving office? No, that was... Oh, I'm sorry. That's when the civil case was filed. That was after. That was after the civil case was filed. Okay. Well, so at the time the civil case was filed, that's... Well, actually, let me back up. Let's go to the first comments when he's leaving office. He tells you about what's in the sheriff's safe in his office, now your office. Correct. Is that is that right? Right. Anything else about that you recall? No. Any other conversation about the Avery matter? No. Did he tell you why he had it in the vault? No. He said somebody from, some inmate from Brown County sent it to him. That's all I know. So he said it came from it came to him directly from an inmate? No, he didn't. I don't know where it if it came direct or where it came from. All I know is it was there. Okay. So he didn't tell you how he got it. No. Or why it was there as opposed to being in the vault. Correct. Bigger vault. Correct. Did he tell you that it had been shared with anybody? I think the Berensons. And this is this, this is certainly before Mr. Avery had been exonerated in this case. Correct. Do you know if it was before the motions to get a new DNA test have been filed? I believe. That is, you think it was before that? Yes. So to your knowledge, was there any legal action pending relating to the Avery case at that at the time that Sheriff Kucerich and you, or ex-Sheriff Kucerich and you, had the conversation about the inmate document that was in that little vault? Not that I'm aware of. Did you look at the document, the document from the inmate? I believe I did. And if it'll refresh your recollection, let me give you back Exhibit 139 and invite your attention to the second paragraph from the bottom that begins by saying, quote, the first document, end quote. That, okay, that would be. You think that's it? It could be. It's in the right time frame. Okay. You're not aware of anything more than one affidavit from some, well, you know the term jailhouse snitch. Mm-hmm. You ever heard that term? That's a fair term for Mr. Lucero. Form of the question. Objection, no foundation. Correct? I suppose. Okay. And this is not the first docu the first accusation you've ever heard made by a jailhouse snitch. Correct. Bascom, object to the form. Object to relevance. And is this the first, is this the only affidavit that you're aware of that comes from a person in the category of being a jailhouse snitch about Mr. Avery? Form the question. Yes. Object to the form. Yes. Okay. So there is no other similar affidavit that you ever saw that relates to Mr. Avery, correct? Correct. And obviously, you know from the DNA analysis and the order of the court that the particular allegations made by this person are just plain false, correct? Object to the form foundation. From this witness, speculation. Go ahead, sir, if you know. 
I don't know. You don't know. That is, you think it's possible that Mr. Avery committed, I'm sorry, said he committed the offense when he didn't. Uh, Cabelli, object to the form, and I'm going to, you can answer, Sheree, then we're going to pause. I have no idea. All right, let's pause here just for a moment and, and talk about, the, because now we've covered several more uh, really uh, pretty uh, damning things. I say damning, maybe that's the wrong word. I think odd things. And we'll first talk about the big vault that he, he says that, you know, this case file is, was in the banker boxes. And the reason that it was kept there in this locked vault that only basically three people had access to was because otherwise it would have been kept downstairs. But there was a lot of people wanting access to the, to this, you know, these files. So that doesn't really fly for me at all. It just doesn't fly for me. If people are asking for access, you know, quite often, wouldn't that be kind of a pain in the ass to have to go to the vault, especially if they kept it locked, uh, you know, on a pretty much have to go in basis and then leave and relock the vault so nobody could just walk in there. Wouldn't that be just kind of a big pain in the ass? I mean, that's just me thinking. As Yeah, I, I felt like it sounded a little illogical personally. Yeah, it, it, it does to me as well. So, uh, and, you know, this... Uh, this report, or uh, yeah, this report that Coleman wrote, we've got a copy of it. It wasn't written on the standard uh, report from a police officer. It was written on a different type of whatever report form. It wasn't a standard kind of reporting. That's number two. I don't have that handy, but. And then uh, the next thing is um, this conversation that he's dancing around about Bergner. And I can't think of that other city uh, official, uh, law enforcement official uh, that was also involved that met with Kosorek back in real time in 85 and their concerns about Gregory Allen. And he's dancing around it like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we have we have written reports and I don't know if we necessarily have testimony per se that they did go talk to him. He was informed and. Just as a matter of being in the same county, and as much as Gregory Allen did, uh, and even the relationship between Kasurik and Vogel, I find it beyond belief that Kasurik was not well aware of Gregory Allen and his reign of terror over that region. It wasn't just Manitowoc. He did shit in other areas too, but he did a lot of stuff in Manitowoc. And there's no doubt. Going back to I'm trying to remember when Sunshine Christina, we racked we rack that back to, I'm going to say 80 or 81 time frame. And all the things that he did that were felonies kept getting knocked down to misdemeanors, misdemeanor, fine, a couple of de- days in jail, years of abuse. I don't believe it. I don't. I just do not believe it. I don't. If we didn't have this other information, I couldn't say that, but we do. So I wanted to point that out. Um, what am I missing, guys? One more point that he was trying to hammer on. Oh, the Doug Jones memo, of course. He's not. I'm not sure if he's going to jump into it or not, but the Doug Jones memo is really interesting. Uh, statements about Lincoln Colburn. Now, as I recall, Link said that he wasn't with Colburn, if I'm remembering that correctly. He was not with him. When he talked to that's, him, when Coburn. That's my memory as well. That Coburn talked to him alone. That's what I'm remembering. I could be wrong, but I think that's right. Sorry, I had to get a drink. Um, <laughs> and while we're paused here, we're, um, we're 53 pages in, so we don't have much more to go. Probably, I'm going to guess, uh, 20, 30 minutes. I did want to say hello. I don't. I'm not sure if he's still here, but I want to say hello to uh, TJ. I don't. I think he's joined us as we've been reading. Um, I did see Stacy Seabrook had said hello a few minutes ago I, while we were reading. Um, Stacy, if you're still here or listening later, hello. Thanks for dropping by, Mark Kaz. Yeah, I think that's all I see. 
Have I missed any questions, Rhonda? Have you, oh, you probably haven't had time to check. Let me just scroll. Yeah, I haven't really been able to look at the questions. Yeah, I'm just looking. James, right quick same questions from an inmate. Um, the letter from an inmate, maybe, is what he's talking about. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, there was a letter from some inmate, and I'm not sure if that. Well, I, I'm not sure what letter that is. Uh, it certainly, I don't think, would be the Evans letter that you know. Cam convicting a murder. They went all googly eyed and ape shit about. <laughs> that was yeah. insane. No, that, that wouldn't, it wouldn't have been that letter. But again, keeping all this stuff locked up, uh, you know, his file under lock and key, it, it just doesn't, I mean, I, I don't know who would have been looking into it. Maybe he had other suspicions or worries that, you know, material would disappear out of the case file. I don't know. I, I just don't know. And I don't want to put uh, too much in the window um, out there because that, that would be kind of unfair at the same time. I just think that in his own words, you know, people coming and getting um, material out reports or whatever, making copies, it would just be a big pain in the ass if it was locked up all the time. And I do remember one more thing I wanted to mention. I've mentioned it before at least once, maybe a couple of times. I talked about William Beck and him being the records custodian. And we have a report uh, that this went, and we, I would have never known if we hadn't got the, our hands on these DCI reports, that Beck gave Strauss and Lehman this, some cassette. Now, I suspect that it's some interview um, or, or the dictation that Peterson made. I don't know that. I don't. Because allegedly they couldn't, he gives, a, Beck gives Strauss and Lehman this tape and to the, the 2003 time frame and allegedly they couldn't get it to you know work. They couldn't get anything out of it. And they gave it back several months later, like in April, April or May of 2004, that, that tape went back. I did ask for, uh, I did request a copy of that tape from, Major Cummings at MTSO, but he said no such tape exists. It's gone. Which, I, you know, from a retention standpoint, I guess I can kind of see that, but at the same time, it's part of a criminal investigation. So typically those things are not destroyed. But anyway, that's where we stand with that. And I see one more thing here before we move on. Was G uh, Gregory Allen an informant? And that is been a real suspicion by many of us for a long time actually since we really started learning about his um past and his ability vogel kept knocking these charges down from felonies to misdemeanors he just he did it consistently for years um and him not really getting looked at hard for the bernstein attack he was given an alibi by vogel which turned out to be, um, well, from the report we've got, it wasn't true at all. The officer was never contacted. So why would Vogel say that? I, I, I don't know why. So I, I'm not sure, James. It's been a real suspicion of many of us for, for a long time. I'm not sure he what he would have been informing on in, or, or a yeah. you know, confidential informant. We, we just don't know. It's a black hole. It's a rabbit hole that seems to have no uh, answers. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Alice in Wonderland right. falling all the way down and there's never an ending. <laughs> right. You get stuck in the you know, the tar pits and you can't get out. Yeah. All righty. I think we've covered uh, pretty much well, uh, pretty much all the subjects uh, that we have been reading over as a recap. So let's uh, let's try to get this knocked out. Okay. And you're you're on line eleven. Uh, that is because you, oh, oh. yeah, that's right. Uh, that is because you weren't there when it happened. Right. So you don't have yeah. firsthand knowledge, but as somebody with the law enforcement experience that you have, do you have any reason at all to believe that there is any truth whatsoever in the statement made by Mr. Lucero? Go Valley Objection Foundation. Yeah. 
and form of the question. Asking him to speculate. You'll be allowed to answer the question. No. Okay. Now, with respect to the second conversations with Sheriff Kosarek, again, at that stage, ex-Sheriff Kosarek, these happened in conjunction with, well, the early stages of the civil case in which you're a witness here today. Is that right? Correct. And are you able to pin it down any more than that? No. Did you make any memos about it or take any notes or have a calendar that says a uh, meeting with Tom Kucerich or anything like that? No. <laughs> what causes you to relate it to the civil case filing? Well, he would have stopped in the office and the subject would have come up. Uh, well, uh, was that the first time he had stopped in the office since he left? Oh, no. He's been in numerous times. And he never discussed the Avery case on those stoppings in at the first at the office? No, no, not with me. So this is the first time that he's back in the sheriff's department discussing the Avery case with you, true? I don't believe he came in to discuss the Avery case. He was there for some reason, but the subject came up. But that wasn't the main purpose of his visit. No, but he was in your office discussing the Avery case. Yes. And that was the first time that it happened, correct? Since he left the office. I believe so, yes. And when he had this discussion with you, what can you recall him saying? I believe it was mostly referring to Bergner and his statement that he had called him and told him about Alan. And Sheriff sa said he had no recollection of a call from Bergner and he didn't know of Alan. Uh huh. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this, sometimes these are really hard to read. They really are. It, it's really <laughs> difficult to... Anyway, when, good thing. Uh, yeah, okay. Did he say that this was something that was being discussed in the media? I mean, did you know who Greg Allen was then? No. Do you, <laughs> did you know what he was talking about, what Kucerich was talking about? I knew who Alan was at the time of the conversation, the first. Uh, that is when, uh, in, whenever the conversation was that you're now describing. Did I know who Alan was? By that point, you knew who Greg Allen was? Yes. I take it you knew who Greg Allen was at least as far as back as September of 2003, correct? Which is when the exoneration took place. That's when I knew about Greg Allen, yes. Oh, my God. Can you believe this? Oh my, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I can. Oh, yeah, I, I can. I mean, mm -hmm. I know I, I can too, but it's so bad. It is. <sighs> And prior to that time, had you known anything about Gregory Allen? Never heard of him. Ever heard the name? Ever had any interaction with him that you know of? No. So in 2003, you learned that one of the things that's happened is that not only did Mr. Avery not commit the crime that he had been convicted of and incarcerated for, but there was pretty solid evidence that somebody else had done it, correct? And... In particular, Gregory Allen had done it, true? Correct. And did you at that stage do anything in your department to try to figure out how that happened? No. Did you conduct any internal investigation of your own? Oh, I'm, it's jumping. Sorry. I can't see. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Oh, bad. <laughs> it's okay. Did you conduct any internal investigation of your own department to see how this had taken place? No, none of the people that were involved in the case in the investigative part were there. So does that mean you had considered conducting an investigation, but then decided after you had identified the people that were involved 
and learned that they were no longer there, that there would be no point in this invest in the investigation. Wow. Correct. But that is a mental process you went through. That is, you consider conducting an investigation. You determine the identities of the people who were involved. You determine their present connections with the sheriff's department. You learned that they were no longer with the sheriff's department and then decided there would be no investigation. Form the question. Is that true? Correct. When did you go through that process? It would have been about the same time as the district attorney told me that Steve was being released. And did you discuss that with district attorney Rohr? No. He's the district attorney who told you that, I take it, correct? Correct. Did you discuss it with anybody in the district attorney's office? No. Did you discuss it with anybody on the Manitowoc County Board? No. Discuss it with anybody in the world? No. Make any memos about it? No. Okay, so now we're a little later in time. A civil case has been filed, and we're back on the scene of Tom Kucerich being in your office discussing with you the Avery case for the first time since he left office, right? Correct. And at that time, he brings up the name of Tom Bergner and the name of Gregory Allen. Is that right? I believe so. I mean, or did you ask him about it? Did you bring up the Bergner thing? No, don't recall how it came up. You were aware by that point in time that a person from Manitowoc Police Department named Bergner had stated that he had gone through, gone to the sheriff's, sheriff's office and talked with Mr. Kucerich about Gregory Allen, correct? Object, objection to the form. I learned that through the grapevine. I didn't hear that directly from Bergner. Okay. I mean, but I take it the, the grapevine would include, for example, the attorney general's report of this, of its investigation concerning this case, right? True. Yes. Because certainly you read that report, right? Yes. And you're aware that that report reflects the fact that Mr. Bergner stated that he had gone to Mr. Kucerich and talked to him. Right. About Mr. Allen and in particular, Mr. Allen being a live and likely suspect in the Berenson assault, correct? Correct. Okay, so when Mr. Kucerich had this conversation with you and Mr. Allen in your office, this wasn't news to you. That is, this wasn't the first time you had ever heard Mr. Allen being identified as a suspect or the assertion that Mr. Bergner had said he had talked to Mr. Kucerich, right? Correct. Did you ask Mr. Kucerich whether Mr. Bergner had ever come to talk to him? No, he... Or did he just... That's what he told me. Say that to you. Correct. Okay. He brought up the subject and he said it didn't happen. I don't know. At least that he didn't recall it happening. I don't know who brought up the subject, but he doesn't remember talking to Bergner, or he didn't. Well, when you say you don't know who brought up the subject, did you ask him whether he had had the conversation with Bergner? I don't know. I don't recall. So you may have. Possible. And when he said that, what was his demeanor? Object to the form. He was fine, normal. Just matter of fact? Yes. This has been said, but it didn't happen. Object to the form. That's all? Correct. And did you tell him he should do anything about that? No. Did you suggest that he might want to take some action based on that? No. Did you ask him if he had told anybody else that he had not had any recollection of Mr. Bergner talking to him? No. 
Had you seen any public statements attributed to Tom Kucerich in which he said he had said that he had no recollection of Mr. Bergner speaking with him prior to your conversation with him? Not that I recall. Did you at any time after your conversation with Mr. Kucerich see anything in the media in which Mr. Kucerich asserted that he had not spoken with Mr. Bergner about Mr. Allen? Not that I recall. So did you do anything in response to that statement by Mr. Kucerich? No. Again, did you memorialize it in any way? No. Did you report it to anyone? No. Did you, for example, tell District Attorney Rohrer that that's what had been told to you by Mr. Kucerich? No. Anyone else no. in his office? No. Did you tell anybody at all in the world that no that you recall? I'm sorry? No. Okay. So in again, did you have any conversation yourself with Mr. Bergner on this subject? He did call me on the phone one day. Okay. And can you tell me what that when that was? No, it would have been sometime after the fact. After which fact? After all this. After the conversation with Mr. Kucerich? Right. For example? Right. That we've just been discussing? Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me what he said when he called? He said that there was some statements being attributed to himself that he didn't make. Okay. But he didn't elaborate on what they were. Did you ask him to elaborate? No. Did he say anything more about it? No. Did you ask him anything more about it? No. <sighs> what? God. No, wait a minute here. This is insane. <laughs> Bergner, the, uh, the, the city police guy, is calling the sheriff because this is after the fact reporting that he's statements have been made about him that he didn't make and and Kassark did or uh, Peterson didn't want to question him about that and investigate and get to the bottom. I mean, these are these are detrimental statements. I mean, this is bad. These are, yeah, these are very important things. Statements. And, you damn yeah, damn statements. straight. Yeah, and he's and just he did, uh, he's. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Jack. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, please. I, I just, so it says one of two things. Either he's completely incompetent, number one, or number two, he's just fucking lying. <laughs> so, I mean, those are your two choices. Uh, yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's to me, really... I don't know. Yeah. Anybody else got any comments about that? Looks like, um, What's Millie say here? They can't even write a statement. Can't even write a statement in time, let alone lock files away. Safekeeping. I don't buy it. Yeah, this is really, really strange. Well, can I make a comment? Please. What, what it represents to me um, is a total breakdown in the system uh, from top to bottom. It's pretty obvious that uh, Peterson... He's under strict instructions. The guy's coated himself with Teflon. Under no circumstances is he going to uh, commit to anything, anything that's going to be incriminating to both himself, Colburn, Lenk, and Kasarik, and Vogel. So he's playing dumb. I agree with uh, just Rhonda. You, what you are witnessing here is corruption, at its purest form, in action. The a gentleman that's interviewing um, uh, Peterson absolutely that's, knows he's that's lying. Glenn. That's he Glenn. Knows, he knows he's lying his ass off. Yep. He yeah. knows that. But he can't make Peterson answer a question or questions that he doesn't want to. So he's, gather, he, he's gathering all this information ready to attack Kasarik and Vogel on. So he's putting all this in the memory bank. 
And don't you find it ra rather remarkable at the lengths that these desperados who call themselves law enforcement officers have gone to protect, protect a vicious known sexual predator. Yep. It is That's the most insane, inane, innocuous thing I've ever heard from law enforcement officers where every one of these guys are playing dumb, have no memory, have no recollections, refuse to answer, and they are protecting a known sexual predator. Yet we have programs like Convicting a Murderer that absolutely tore Stephen Avery a new one. Imagine, and they ignored all they ignored all this. Imagine if they were doing a program on Gregory Allen. The guy has got a rap sheet longer than the lies told by all of these guys, and yet they all play dumb. And isn't it remarkable what Kasserik had done? He had got a statement from an inmate snitch to say that Stephen Avery had confessed to attacking Penny Bernstein and put it in the safe because that is exactly what he would have brought out and wrangled it in front of the of the attorneys to say, well, hey, he he admitted to the uh, crime. What more do you want? Right. And isn't it remarkable, guys, that when the phone call came from Brown County to say, hey, listen, guys, we got somebody here that it's, uh, admitted to this crime. You got someone in your jail that is innocent, and they all ran a mile, and they all ignored it. And look how they back each other up. They're all acting dumb. So when we hear this, guys, you've got to understand how close this was to Stephen getting arrested for the murder of Teresa Horbach. how all these moments were coming to a head. And guess who was next on the chopping block? Kasserik and Vogel. Right. So now you understand the a bomb that went off during these depositions and the desperation to nail Stephen and to silence him ASAP. Guys, you can see it. You can hear it, guys. Right. Well, you know, anyone that is new and, and doesn't understand, you can look in, in our library on the website, and uh, we have many files on Gregory Allen. He has his own section and he committed dozens, I mean dozens, of misdemeanors and felonies. And until um, he did one thing, he, he got in a little bit of trouble over, but it, 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 even then the proceeding was, the, the charges were knocked down. He didn't really serve much time. But he really didn't get really hammered until 95 or 96, whenever it was, he got convicted and put away but that doesn't preclude what we don't really know this guy was a monster and i've long i've said it before i've long suspected he's probably got bodies in uh maybe even that area let alone other areas that he traveled in we know he traveled as far yeah. west as nebraska uh yes can kansas a trial of destruction jack 61 yes. a trial of That's destruction right. and we, it, it, we don't we don't know what i'm sorry we don't know what all he did down south because he traveled to georgia alabama louisiana texas we have no idea what he did but there was a there was a detective in green bay that was investigating go ahead doc to, to me i am actually embarrassed when i hear seasoned law enforcement officers talking absolute tripe it is absolutely clear that they had conversations behind closed doors, keep tight, shut up, don't rat on anybody, and we're going to get out of this, right? And are you try and don't forget that Stephen Avery is sitting down in the courtroom or yep. the room that they were in listening to all of this. 
And he must be thinking, holy shit, the wheeling and dealings that were happening, the wheel, the machinations that were happening behind closed doors. And don't forget that Sheree Colhain sat on that result likely for a year. Yeah. Because when Judge Hazelwood handed over the, the court order to say, right, I want you to do the forensic analysis on the pubic hairs, it took over a year for, for her to do one or two days jobs worth of stuff. Yep. I dare say that she had the result, told her superiors, and they had to think, what the hell are we going to do now? How are we going to protect ourselves? And that's why you see what they're gathering up are the breadcrumbs. They're putting together a file. They're putting together a cover story that they can say, well, hey, we've got all these documents. Yeah, we put them in the safe. And, oh, yeah, if we've got to go to court, we're just going to take them out and just show you. But notice what they're doing, guys, is they're back tracking they are de-engineering the shit that they created from 1995 and they're all slapping each other on the back saying we're going to get out of this what you're hearing here guys is pure utter weapons grade corruption straight from the lips of high ranking law enforcement officers and in Australia, we have things called royal commissions in which commissioners go to prison for shit like this. And that's why, guys, it's unbelievable when I see convicting a murderer trivialize all of the civil suit. Oh, yeah, nothing to see here. Yeah, the and insurance would have paid You hear Candace Owen say, well, the insurance would have paid it out. They would yep. have paid for it. Yep. Mm, no, and, <laughs> no. And we have a guy who spent an additional 10 years perfecting his craft and terrorizing the women that he encountered, including raping them. And this was all because of law enforcement officers closing their eyes. Well, yeah. you can see just from this range of questioning, and we have the other statements from Bergner and, and the other officials, and there's no they knew the Manitowoc County corporate and the, even the state knew this couldn't be, this couldn't go to court. They did. This could not go to the open court. And there's no way Glenn and Kelly were prepared and they knew that these guys knew their shit. Yeah. They could not have this in open court. There's just, and you know, whatever happened, you know, I, I don't want to put up any big conspiracy, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying, from their yeah. for their yeah their viewpoint, they were not going to have this in open court. No, but you know, sorry to harp on, but this is my final comment. You cannot divorce what was happening in his civil suit to his arrest for the murder of Teresa Horbach. The two run hand in hand. No doubt. Hand in hand. And you could understand the massive massive motivation that law enforcement had to silence Stephen Avery, get him off the streets, arrest him, and to gag him because this was going to damage the reputations from Kasserik down, including Vogel. This was a team effort. And don't forget, the main perpetrator of a lot of these disgusting crimes was Gregory Allen himself. Gregory uh, Allen. They are protecting a vicious serial rapist. I cannot believe what I'm hearing, guys. Well, and not only that, we've talked about it. I'll just briefly mention the uh, cold case hit that happened in May of 2005, the very month the deposition started, the matching of his Gregory Allen's DNA in June of 2005. The arrest warrant that was written in September, which is a month before this deposition, that Wisconsin officials would have definitely known about. Now, I, I, I feel certain that Glenn and Kelly were not aware. I'm, I feel 1,000% certain saying that, or the depositions would have taken a different flavor. Uh, but 
they couldn't risk Glenn and Kelly finding out about that because they would have blown no. it would have blown this to absolute smithereens. I'm sure of it. Uh, correct. It, it would have all landed on the doorstep of Tom Kasarik and Vogel. That's all right. So That's right. these so these guys were gathering up all the ammunition necessary to uh, really drive the screws into Kasarik and Vogel, right? And you know, could you imagine these guys? Tom Bergener must be thinking, hell, I go and see the sheriff, I tell him all these statements, and now the sheriff is in total denial. Yeah. And then he appears on television, remember, Tom Kasarik, with a smile on his face when, sure. the, when the interviewer asked him, well, you know, it was only a mistake in identity. We thought that we had the right guy at that time and not That's one of them, ship. not there one of them apologised to Stephen Sorry, we got it wrong. You know why? Because they targeted him, and that's bloody the, obvious. Come on, Duper, guys. Duper's delight. That's yep. small. No yeah. question yes. about it. Yep. It's Ron. absolutely diabolical. It, yeah, it is. It, it is. I, that's just the way I see it because I, I've read so much, and I, I guess that just knowing what. Um, it, it, you have to you have to go through the material. You, you can't just glance at it and say hey, this is nothing. It's not true. It is something, and they knew it. To ignore it is you know it's, it's just hypocritical. It's just like if I were to ignore uh, Stephen's shady character, his shortcomings. Right. I don't ignore it. I understand it. I've known it for years. That doesn't make him a murderer. I'm, right. it, it, I don't ignore any of it like I've been accused of doing. But certainly the state was in control. They had they they the ones that had control because they controlled virtually all the evidence. Anyway, I thought I just thought this was a, a really good point to drive home. There is no way that they wanted this they could have it in open court. There's no way it would have absolutely oh. blew up in their face. I'm sure of it. Anyway, all right. Uh, any more comments before we get rolling? I see we've had a few in the chat. It looks like uh, maybe Neverly's in the chat under the foul play name. No, that was Hello. that was me. Sorry. Oh no, 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 no. Yo, you're fine. No, no. I got fine. lazy about switching over to YouTube. It's, it's fine. All righty. Let's. Uh, we've got. Um, <sighs> well, we've we've got roughly probably twenty pages to go or so. So let's 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 see if we can knock this out. Okay. You know where you're at? There, yeah, it's at the top. Uh, just, yeah, I'm going to take my cue from what's right there. Did he say that these were statements relating even to the Avery case? They were related to Alan, Gregory Allen. Okay, so he calls you and says that there are some statements being attributed to him that relate to Gregory Allen. And he didn't make he said any of those statements. He said he no, he just said he didn't make them. So he he didn't make them. But when you deal with the news media, that's not unusual. And did he identify the statements for you in any regard at all? No. And you didn't ask him. No. What statements? No. Did you ask him why he was calling you? No. Did he say why he was calling you? I think he was questioning the statements. I think there was a news report out sometime prior that he was upset about. And did he identify that news report? No. So you believe that he was upset about the news, about the news report, even though he didn't say that? Yes. What caused you to have that belief? Because he denied what saying whatever the news report was attributing to him. And you never you asked him know. why it is that he felt a need to talk to you about that? No. As opposed to someone else? No. Did you ever talk to him in person about, no. that, about that subject? No. 
when you spoke with him by phone, do you know where he was calling you from? Did he say anything? No. Did he indicate that he'd like to get together and talk about this? No. Did you indicate that? No, no. So the did he say anything, by the way, at that time about whether or not he had yet been interviewed by agents from the Wisconsin Department of Justice? No, he didn't. Did he say that he had been interviewed by a newspaper reporter from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel? No. Did he by any chance mention a reporter whose first name is Tom? Well, did he say, did he name any reporter at all? No, no. Okay, name Kirchner, ring any bells with you? No. As being something that he had discussed? No. Did he say anything about having had conversations with other people, including people in the district attorney's office? No. Have you now exhausted your recollection of everything he said to you and you said to him during this conversation concerning Gregory Allen? Yes. You've had, I don't know what that is. Um, oh, blah, 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 okay. You've had conversations, I take Mike Griesbach about the Avery case, correct? Not that I recall. How about with Mark Rohr? Yes. Do you recall Mike, Mike Griesbach being present when you had conversations with Mark Rohr? No, he may have been with him, but I'm not sure. Tell me what you can recall about your first conversation with Mark Rohr relating to the Avery case. Well, Mark came to my office and told me that DNA evidence had come back and showed that the DNA belonged to Gregory Allen, and he was going to contact the courts and see about getting Steve released. <coughs> Sorry. That's funny. I just, that's a joke. I'm sorry. That was my own comment there. <sighs> I agree. And <laughs> Thank you. And that was before, obviously, Steve was released, true? That's correct. It was before order for his release. Mm-hmm. What he was expressing to you was, I guess, what you could be called inside information. That is, it had not yet been placed on the public record. Correct. Letting you know that something was coming and you should be aware of it. Right. What was your reaction to that? Well, if he's innocent, let him out. Okay. Did you and Mr. Rohr have any discussions about what would happen within your department relating to the case? No. Did you have any discussion with Mr. Rohr about the timing of what was to follow? No. And how long would it take for the court process to go on or when he'd be out or anything like that? No. Any discussion at that point about comments with the media? No. Was this a face-to-face -face conversation? Yes. And what did you understand from the comments made to you by Mr. Rohr to be the purpose of that? To let me know. That face-to-face -face meeting. To let me know it was coming, that this was coming down the pike, and that there would probably be news media knocking at the door. Uh, about how long was the whole conversation? A couple minutes, or was it longer? Not much more, five, ten minutes. How about after that? Did you have other conversations with Mr. Rohr concerning the Avery case? Not that I recall. So except for this one conversation that was, you know, five to 10 minutes long, you don't recall any conversations with him concerning the Avery case? No. Is that so? Correct. And do you not recall then any conversation with him concerning, for example, this business with Sergeant Colburn and Lieutenant Lank? I don't recall that. Do you recall any conversation with Mr. Rohr or Mr. Griesbach about Mr. Allen? Other than the DA telling me that the DNA was attributed to Gregory Allen, that would be it. 
in that very first conversation. Right. The only one that you can recall now. Right. Okay. So as you're sitting here and as we've gone through this discussion, you have no recollection of any meetings or conversations, either face-to-face -face or telephone or through any other format between yourself and Mr. Rohrer, except the one that you've described that occurred before Mr. Avery was released. Is that true? Correct. And the same is true with respect to Mr. Griesbach. Correct. Let's turn to Dennis Vogel for a moment. Do you recall having any conversations with him from, well, for the moment, let's say from September of 2003 to the present? I haven't. Concerning the Avery case? I haven't talked to Dennis Vogel since he left office. Uh, okay. How about before he left office? You indicated you do not recall him being, you do not recall being prepped before your testimony with him. Do you recall any conversation with him at all None. about this case? None, None whatsoever. Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm getting into it now. I can't help myself. <laughs> That's okay. Did you ever have any conversation with anybody in his office concerning a belief about Gregory Allen being the suspect, being the person who actually assaulted Ms. Beardson? No. Off the record for 30 seconds. Back on, oh, okay. Uh, off the record, uh, looks like two minutes back on the record. Okay, let me follow up on a few things. Stephen Avery is taken to the jail, turned over for prints and pictures. Do you know to whom? I believe Vic Beretta. And can you spell that name? B-U-R-E-T-T-A. Uh, okay, and was a jailer, and he was a jailer at the time? Correct. Second. You also indicated that you had to collect pubic hair and other evidentiary samples. I take it that was just from Mr. Avery? Yes. Again, that was nothing, that was not anything that had you involved with Mrs. Danson. Correct. Next, there was a prior ship commander who had given you some information you believe on, ju on July 29th 2005. Would that have been Mr. Belke? No, Mr. Beck. Mr. Beck. Okay. You can't even read his writing. I'm impressed. Uh, there was a point at which in at which in your conversation with Mr. Lang and Sergeant Colburn, they indicated that, well, actually, I guess to be more precise. It's Sergeant Colburn who indicated that he had directed the Brown County caller to a detective. Do you recall who was who that detective was? No idea. And the, you made a comment during the examination about learning about the Bergner statement to Kucerich through what you described as the grapevine. Can you be any more specific than that? I mean. Do you know who it was that made a comment or is it from the news media or just what your source of information was? Believe the news media. And are you somebody who is a news hound and covers print media and electronic media and radio and all that stuff? Or do you get all your news information from one source generally? Oh, no. Uh, okay, what would be your media sources back in 2003? Newspaper, radio, and TV. So I take it you're not able to tell me which of those it would have been. No. It could have been any or all. Yes. Let me take a note, of, a look at my note here. 
In your very first conversation with Tom Kucerich about this matter back in July of 1985, you indicated that you were told to arrest Steve Avery for attempted first degree homicide. Is that right? Correct. There's no reference of sexual assault? Not at that point. None. I mean, you had no idea what the circumstances were of the attempted first degree homicide, whether there was a weapon, whether this guy should be considered armed. I mean, anything like that? Form of the question. No. And you had no idea who the victim was. Oh, I knew the victim. Oh, uh, at that time? I knew the victim. You did? I knew who she was. Okay, so you knew he was, the information you had gotten from the prior shift commander, would that have been, would that have involved sexual assault? It could have. But again, your directions from Kusurik have nothing to do with sexual assault in the first conversation. It's all about homicide. Correct. And later, when when you're at the jail, or at least after you've been, after you've arrived at the jail, you have a conversation again with Kusarek in which he is talking about getting these samples, correct? Correct. And the samples include pubic hair, right? Correct. And based on your experience, you realize that you don't ordinarily obtain pubic hair samples unless there's an allegation of some form of sexual contact or sexual assault, true? Correct. Do you recall whether or not Tom Kucerich said anything in that second conversation about sexual assault? I don't recall anything specific, no. Okay, you lying son of a bitch. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> By Mr. Kelly. One more. By Mr. Glenn. Oh, you got some? Okay. By Mr. Kelly. You turned Mr. Avery over to Mr. Beretta at the jail? Correct. Do you recall seeing anybody else on duty at the jail? No, the only one I dealt with was Vic. Okay. Did you specifically, do you remember seeing Dave Dvorak there at the jail? No. Okay, thanks. That's all. Okay, it looks like there's no questions from the other side. They're off the record. Wow. Ugh. Okay. God. So that was fucking infuriating. So we I'm got really ten sorry. pages. We got ten pages of whatever. That tells the this is broken down, okay. It's a different format. This one's un, a little unusual. Uh, but it's a different just it's just a different format of the deposition itself and then the index okay that's why this is no longer okay interesting so let me pop oh. this off the screen and you, if you guys have any comments doc or Shree, if you guys want to talk for just a moment i'm going to look back at the beginning of this deposition and see if we can get the um if I he's a brother mouth. or a cousin oh, okay um, go ahead, you guys. I got, I think you all know how I feel. <laughs> well, uh, I think it was pretty self-explanatory here. Um, it's obvious to me and anybody listening, surely, uh, that uh, Peterson uh, was under strict instruction uh, to minimize the damage and the fallout of what was going to happen they knew this was going to this was going to hit them hard, and the mere fact that they put everyone in a silo, uh, that there was a failure to communicate, um, is just simply remarkable. Um, his absolute denial about knowing anything about Tom Bergener was really really telling. So Tom Bergener, think about it, rings out of the blue. And Peterson doesn't ask him, oh, well, you want to clarify your statements? What are you talking about? What are you upset about? What are the statements that you're saying are not attributable to you? Kenneth, if you believe Kenneth Peterson, um, no, he didn't ask him anything. 
Do you know what the call was about? Nope. Did you ask him about what it was about that he called you? Nope. Did you ask any questions? Nope. Have you ever, ever heard such utter bullshit from a senior police officer, law enforcement officer? <laughs> and Peterson is the same person that said, if we wanted to get rid of Stephen Avery, we would have just killed him. The same yes. guy. That's right. And now, now he's acting as though he's got complete memory loss, can't understand or notice the questions that were being asked to him, all very self-incriminating questions. Did you know about this? No. Nope. Did you talk about this? No. Nope. So he absolutely shut shop. The guy was lying straight through his teeth. Sorry. He ran, he ran like a scalded dog all the way the other oh, direction, God, yeah. dog. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, to clarify, I was incorrect because he's uh, Glenn's asking about siblings and family being involved in law enforcement. He says, oh, yes, I have one that's a reserve deputy. Glenn says, and who's that? Is that Keith? He, Peterson answers Keith. So it is a brother, and he's married to Brenda Peterson. So I was incorrect. Keith is the brother of Sheriff Peterson. But they didn't talk. They didn't see each other much. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you say so, I'm sorry. That's I don't what, believe it. But I don't either. Well, you know, I, having you know, having had a brother, I mean, he's, he's passed away now, but you know, we didn't go for you know years and not talk. I mean, we may not... And I've been, you know, he's been busy, being busy with life, me being busy with life. We may not have had to be the chance to get together, you know, for and talk for, a, you know, a couple of weeks here or there. Um, but years? I know my dad and, and one of his brothers, he had two brothers. Him and one of his brothers got into it, and they didn't speak for a long time. And I was, when I got older and really kind of understood not really. I really put the hammer on my dad about that and my uncle. It was like, guys are just dumb, just dumb and dumb as hell. It's your brother, you know. You work it out. I'm, you know, don't. Not talking is not an option for me. I mean, short of, you know, one of them committing a horrendous crime against somebody in his family. Okay, that could drive a bit deep enough wedge that you're going to sever ties. But over something dumb, come on. So. I don't know. I, I just found it. I found this uh, n not socializing or having discussions with Keith. I, I, I just don't. I'm sorry. I don't buy it. Maybe not socializing, of course, family wise. That, that could happen, sure. But not talking. I, I don't believe it. Anyway, glad to clear that up. Yeah, it was. Uh... That's why I just thought it was odd. I was like, what, your brother? And you haven't spoken yeah. to him in three years? <laughs> yeah. Like, was there yeah. some major falling out or what happened? But yeah, it sounded like there was something, and but Glenn did, didn't dive into it. I wanted to pop this one on the screen. This will be the next one we do next time we do depositions. This is a, also on the 13th, and you can see from the time frame, it's at 2 or 3 when his commences. So there was a... There's a little break. I'm sure they probably got them some date or whatever for lunch and uh, continued on. Um, and he is a former detective with Manitowoc. And this is a very interesting deposition as well because they, they get off into some interesting uh, things. I remember we covered this on Sunshine Christina's uh, Crime Theory Exchange. Uh, we got She got pretty deep into... Larry Conrad, some interesting, very interesting things. So anyway, let me pop this off. We're we're done with that. Uh, can Susan, I just? I didn't. I'm oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go just. Go ahead, go. I was just gonna say I didn't see your Beretta joke, Susan. Um, but I'll look for it. <laughs> <laughs> Beretta, I remember that show. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm guessing that's what she's talking about. I didn't catch it either, but I, I, it's just impossible for me to scan back and forth like that while I'm scrolling. I, I just can't do it. If I had a dual monitor set up, I, I probably could be more effective in doing that. So, anyway. Me too. I think this is what she's talking about. Did Beretta have a white cockatoo on his shoulder? 
I get it. <laughs> That's funny. That's a I good one. I remember Beretta. <laughs> oh yeah, that was uh, Robert Blake. I loved. I loved that show. I did too. Um, sorry, Doc. Go ahead. I apologize. I, I was going to say that if you're going to be a serious student of uh, this case, I'm talking about the murder of Teresa Horbach. An absolute essential component is what happened to Stephen in 1985. You you can't divorce the two events. You you really have to have a thorough no knowledge of what happened to him in the Penny Bernstein case. The yeah. main players, um, their total lack of any form of remorse, responsibility, uh, it all comes hand in hand. Because I know that a lot of people will take on the case uh, and just, you know, look at MAM1, MAM2. You've got to go much deeper than that. Uh, the roots uh, of what happened to Stephen uh, back in 2005, they stem from 1985. I seriously, seriously believe that. Absolutely. A absolutely. And then even the events of 2005 when, you know, Sunshine Christina dug up this gold mine of information about Gregory Allen and what happened to that, what he did to that woman in, in uh, Minnesota, uh, Hennepin County, Minnesota. He beat the hell out of her and sexually assaulted her and uh, got, you know, for years got away with it. I mean, he wasn't, and even once he was brought, you know, uh, they, you know, I said earlier this arrest warrant was written in September of 2005 the, the really strange thing, and I know there is typically a delay with you know, somebody's in prison in one state, and then they find out there's another, another crime that this person did in another state. Sure, there's a delay in serving a warrant, but this warrant wasn't served for 27 months. And I'm sorry. I have a real problem with that. Well, I think it's pretty obvious, J61. Um, sure. Everything is everything is incredibly self-serving and also to deflect away from the department, the MTSO, the law yep. enforcement officers. They want to distance themselves to this horrible and tragic event. And, you know, what I still can't get around with the report that Peg Lockenschlatter did, essentially whitewashing the entire case, not blaming anybody, and then to have the audacity to point a finger at the victim herself, Penny Bernstein. It's your fault. Yep. You, you pointed out Stephen Avery. So hence, that's what the law enforcement officers went with. Of course, none of the psychological manipulation that was done right at day one, when this poor woman was being questioned by Dvorak, the sheriff and everybody else, where she couldn't even see out of her own eyes. They were so badly bruised and beaten and read. And she signed, remember, the report without even seeing the contents. Yep. Because from day one, their focus was only on one individual, Stephen, right. from day one. So the investigator bias was there from that evening. There's no doubt that Kasserik, and Vogel were targeting Stephen. They saw it as a quick way to get him off the street permanently, and they ignored all the red flags, all the warning signs. That's both Kasserik and Vogel, who had individuals go up to them and said, I think you better look at this guy. The MO, he represents Gregory Allen, not Stephen Avery. That's and right. for God's sake... When Gregory Allen continuously comes to go and see Vogel personally, are you trying to tell me that Vogel forgot that Gregory Allen committed lewd acts against women on the very same stretch of beach? And violent other violent acts as well. That Not necessarily on that. Yeah, yeah they were downgraded. Downplayed. So all of a sudden, Stephen Avery with what? 16 material witnesses, key material witnesses. Yep. Um, the sheriff goes, you're not allowed to call your wife because you're going to form some type of alibi, which meant that all of the individuals that saw Stephen standing right next to them 
were all liars, every one of them. Yep. Right. That, that, guys, that is the scary thing at the lengths that law enforcement has gone to distance themselves against a violent sexual predator and cocoon Gregory Allen and go after Stephen full throttle. And they're still doing it today. That's right. Uh, most most people, I mean, other than, I mean, yeah, I mean, other people know now that we, you know, this uh, uh, Sunshine Christina discovered about this other case, Seeking Truth, got this huge 650-page report from Green Bay about Gregory Allen that has been compiled from going, stretching all the way back, like I said, to 80 or 81. And even before then, he was suspected in a murder in North Carolina yes. of a young girl. Yes. And it's, I mean, his violent nature, I mean, none of this that happened to Penny fit Stephen. It just didn't. It, it fit Gregory Allen's M.O. He was violent. He beat the hell out of his own wife, broke her jaw. I think that was 84. I, he got a little bit of jail time out of that, but not what he should have got. Um, it's just unbelievable to me, to, all to protect their case. All of it. Oh, correct. They had, they had to deal with the devil. They had to Absolutely. deal with the devil. It, it is it is as simple as that. And I reckon the two attorneys representing Stephen and also Stephen sitting there, that they, they could not believe their ears. They could not believe the ears of what was happening in, in that in that room. Yeah. I, I really wish Glenn and Kelly had found out about the 2005 um, stuff about Alan. It would have changed everything. I'm sure of it. It would have changed the nature of everything that transpired. I'm sure yeah. of it. Yes. But anyway. All righty. We've got just a few questions. Uh, but first, I wanted to pop this on screen. I saw this earlier. T. Lopez uh, became a new YouTube member. We really appreciate your support. And thank you very much. Hope you'll hit the uh, join us and uh, comment. You know, share your thoughts. That's why we're here. We do have a few questions. I'll pop these on the screen, Rhonda, if you want to read them out and we'll try to answer them. Anthony Hills, they had free access to Redot's cabin, I thought. Uh, he allowed, uh, as I remember, uh, Doc, correct me or anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but he did allow them in there, <laughs> the law, law enforcement. Uh, yes, he did. Um, they went through the um, the cabins, and the cabins were cleared. Uh, yeah, so uh, Radon definitely allowed law enforcement officers to go through the deer camp. But it's interesting because that's where Aloof spent a lot of time around the the, the cabins, the hunting yeah. cabins. He did, and that and the, the burn barrel they found. Uh, correct. Yes, correct. Alrighty, next question is from T1, Rhonda. <laughs> T1, <laughs> does anyone have the winning Mega Millions numbers for the next drawing? <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> oh, not me, well, T, not me. <laughs> yeah, I don't have it either, but, you know, if I find, you know, if I well, somehow I find them out, yeah, I'll let you know. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay. <laughs> Next question from T. Uh, uh, question. Bushman was a reserve officer at the time, correct? Reserve, depth, reserve duty was regularly occupied by retired officers. Is that correct? Yeah, retired, semi-retired, whatever, you know. And I, when I say semi-retired, I'm talking about maybe retired, uh, per se, from the sheriff's office as a full-time whatever officer, detective. Um, but still has something else potentially going on the side, another business or whatever. But yeah, typically that that's how that worked out. Now they're not to say that there weren't some younger officers that had another career that was also a reserve deputy. Cause I know that happens too. So, but typically, yeah, I think that's pretty much how it works to you. Alrighty. Let's see all the questions that, that I've seen. I want to, hold 
I want to put this one up by technical difficulties. Has anyone attempted to interview Alan? I don't know, but I not think not that's that I'm aware of. It is interesting. Not that I'm, not that I'm aware of uh, technical difficulties. Uh, maybe, but I've not heard it read heard or read. Mm -hmm. I've I've not, not never heard or read anything, and I would. Well, I mean, I just don't know, you know, I mean, he's getting pretty old now. I think he was born in 54, if I'm remembering right. So that puts him at what, 50, 74, 70, 70, 70, 72. Yep. So I know he's tried several times. No, uh, 70. You know, it would be 70. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Trying to do the math in my head. That's not safe. Yeah, be, be seventy if he was. Yeah, that's right. He'd be seventy this year, fifty four, two thousand twenty four. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I know he's. I think his his parole has come up a few times, and he's tried to get out, but I think they've denied his parole every time. He, oh. This guy, I mean, I don't know what kind of health he's in now, but if he's in any kind of health at all, he would be a danger to the community. I'm sure of it. Yeah, I agree. So and there's Bethany. She's late. She was cut here a little while ago. Sorry, Bethany. Anyway, all right. Uh, let's. Uh, we've been up. Uh, we're we're approaching three hours. So let's uh, let's move this on out and uh, get everyone's final thoughts. And we're gonna go have some dinner. At least I'm gonna have some dinner. Uh, I don't know about the rest Same. of you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Rhonda. Final thoughts. Oh, well, like I said, uh, you guys all know how I feel. I just, I don't even know, like, the depths of what, the, you know, most of you guys know. I don't know dates, and I don't know particular names all the time, and when, what, you know, when, what happened, or where, or anything. I'm not that deep in the research part of it, um, but I, <laughs> I know bullshit <laughs> when I see it and read it. Um, that's how I feel about, well, about most of these depositions, honestly, but for some reason I was even more incensed reading it from this dickhole Peterson. He's just a, he's just a, it's just, the whole thing that was really, uh, disturbing and disappointing and just diabolical. Like, you know, how they, like Doc was saying, you know, I, 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 we always say, all of us always make the comment at some point, how did these, how did these people sleep at night? How do they live with what they've done? And the only thing that I have finally come up with is people with no soul uh, who are led by um, malevolent <laughs> uh, forces they they can sleep because they have no conscious that keeps them from sleeping. So <laughs> that's <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> that's just how I feel about it. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, try not to forget Thursday night, 5 p.m. My channel, just Rhonda. We're going to start a new accuser. So uh, check it out. If you dare. Sweet. Excellent. Thank you for the excellent reading, Rhonda, and uh, helping out with that. Really appreciate that. You're welcome. I think Alrighty. Cherie might have company right now, just, okay. I believe. Um, Her daughter, okay. I think, Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, we'll let Cherie visit and not pester her much. Uh, Jay, final thoughts? Well, I totally agree with Rhonda. I reckon his uh, deposition was a pile of bullshit and he was covering up and he didn't want to <laughs> say anything at all. <laughs> yeah, I have to agree with you. <laughs> it it is. It's terrible. Just absolutely terrible. Uh, yeah. All righty, Jay. Really appreciate you joining us on the panel and, and uh, helping out with the reading. No problem uh, just, at all. I think I think it makes it more. I think it makes it better for us to all 
participate more voices it just makes it gives a little bit more realism i believe so really appreciate that and uh doc final thoughts well i'm very glad um, i got to see this uh, podcast before i get my injections <laughs> because <laughs> i've seen enough bullshit here for a year i mean i was aware of uh, peterson i was aware of the deposition um but just to echo what just ronda said the reason why uh, these guys are so comfortable is because they're serial bullshit artists. They've done this for a long period of time. They know precisely how to cover things up. They know how to protect each other. It's the thin blue line. And they know that Kaserik ran that place uh, like a horror show. And we mustn't forget uh, the Ricky Hochschletter case. It's the same people. It's the same players. It's the same obfuscation. It's the same bullshit. But, you know, karma will come. The karma bus will come. At some stage, it will. You have a look at what's happening now uh, with Kathleen Zona trying to get access to the RAV4. It's exactly the same obfuscation. It's the same legal mumbo-jumbo, the same word salad. It's exactly the same thing. The show is still going on, guys. Uh, what they started in 1985 is still continuing to today. And I hope, I hope justice can be finally be seen for Teresa Horbach. I, I, I honestly really do. Um, but if you keep up with um, trying to prevent people doing their job, uh, I've heard so many arguments. Oh, look, you know, Stephen should just give up and just give up and don't worry about it. You should just die in prison. Well, that's not how it works, guys, right? That's not how it works. Proper justice means let's check out all the avenues. Have we made another mistake? And quite clearly, you can see here in black and white that Stephen was innocent about the attack on Penny Bernstein. He said it from day one. The incredible amount of um, vitriol that he received, his family received. Oh, think about the poor victim, Penny Bernstein. You know, you're showing disrespect. Are you hearing the same things now? Are you hearing exactly the same arguments now? Yep. Yes, you are. The same things that they threw at Stephen and his supporters and his family are the same words being echoed now. It makes you wonder... Who's the one that's got the devious reputation? Who's the one? Right? That's all I'm going to say. Thank you so much, Jack61, and everyone on the panel and chat. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the one great comments and thought, thought-provoking comments as well. And, uh, you know, I know you've been through this information uh, as well as I have. I did put a link in the live chat for anyone that's interested to our links to the our Gregory Allen files that there are, well, probably thousands of pages, but at least at least close to a thousand. One report alone, six hundred and fifty pages. So, and then add to that the uh, material that uh, Sunshine Christina got. Uh, put that back. What, what would you have up there for a second, Rhonda from Stewart? Oh, thanks to the panel and all and Bob. Uh, superb stream once again highlighting the injustice dished out to Avery and others by law enforcement of all levels keep up if you're amazing work we really appreciate this story we, we you know we just my goal has been as I said uh, I think I said it yesterday during we were before we were listening to the calls you know my my interest is what happened during the investigation yeah the 85 case does matter what happened during this investigation, and I must include what happened in, after the lawsuit was filed. I, there's just no way around it. In my opinion, they're tied because of what happened with Kasorik and Vogel. This charge gets hammered on, you know, the day before Kasorik is scheduled to testify. I mean, how big of a, how much bigger of a rat do you need laying in the middle of the road with a stake driven through its heart? You, you just can't, to me, you just can't get any. It's terrible. I mean, to me. But, I, you know, I'm looking at the investigation and then the investigation gets handed off to the prosecutor. 
and they have preliminary hearings while the investigation is going on. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in all that. And then, of course, we move into the trial itself. At the same time, Gregory Allen has an arrest warrant from September of 2005. It gets held out somewhere, and as Rhonda said, in the you know Alice in Wonderland, wherever the hell that's at, doesn't get served on Allen for 27 months. I never heard of such. Never. Especially with nothing that has some kind of legal something attached to it that says, well, we can't serve it because of this, this, and this. There's nothing. It's just not served. Until December of 2007, long after the trial's over, Steve and Brendan are in jail. It's done. Now, of course, there's some, some appeals that start up, but that, that has nothing to do with it at all. I don't, I just, I find it, I, I just find it just in complete uh, re- reverse of due process and the way our system is designed to work. The checks and balances failed because of the people that are there in control. I'm going to shut up about it before I really get on my horse because it really irritates me. Well, and I'll keep Jack, talking I, about uh, it. Oh, please. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please. I, I no, just, please. I just wanted to say there's only one thing worse that could have happened uh, before Kosarek had to testify or give his deposition and uh, worse than what happened with Stephen. And that is if he had just mysteriously died <laughs> like if he had just yes. mysteriously wound up dead that's, that's the right. only worst thing that could have happened to steven uh at, at that particular time because i think i think that would have been a big risk for him though i think there was oh, enough to know that that would have triggered a major investigation right absolutely yeah they were already they were already uh you know they're, the coals were hot on them already as it was, so of course they wouldn't sure. do something like that, but right. that would have been the only worst thing they could have done, <laughs> I, I think. I, agree. I don't know. I agree. Okay, uh, that's all. No, no. That, that, thank you for, for that. Um, Millie had a question. I think we can probably answer this. We we know the dogs are loaded around on the deer camp but were they ever forensically examined? Not that I'm aware of, Millie. Uh, the friends, the, no, I don't think there were any kind of uh, you know swabbing or anything like that done at the cabins that I'm aware of. Do you remember anything, Doc? Uh, essentially, they were given a cursory look, and yeah. nothing, nothing of evidentiary value <laughs> was found in the cabins. Correct, but the uh, uh, Loof uh, paid a lot of attention uh, around the the cabins, and uh, you can see uh, did a circle of them. Um, so remember, Loof is centred for the life scent of Teresa Orbach, and of course hit on one of the burn barrels um, that had police tape around it. But uh, allegedly, nothing of evidentiary value was found at the cabins. Right, but uh, it is a little. I mean, I thought it was a little strange that they put a guard, you know, a light generator and a guard uh, at the burn barrel. They secured it. Oh, correct. Uh, like, like almost immediately. I thought that was a little strange. If there was really, why would they suspect anything there? Uh, yeah, I guess is my point. Thank you, Scooby, for the wonderful words. We really appreciate that. Um, I think that's all we've got. I haven't seen anything else roll by. So, uh, like I said, I, I put up the, the link for Gregory Allen for anybody that wants to check him out. It's an extensive, if you're going to look into Gregory Allen, you might as well just be prepared to, you're going to be spending a lot of time. It, there's a huge amount of material. Um, as I said, to me, it's directly linked to 85 to 2005 for when the lawsuit was filed into 2005 and all the events that happened that year. And then, you know, November 9th, I'll say this before we go, November 9th, they arrest Avery on gun charge. You know, come on, guys. They had known for months those guns were in there. They had been in that cabin or in his trailer before. They Those guns were hanging on the above the bed. That's a whole other story. I'm going to stop. I'm going to get rattled off on another 10-minute 
Calm down, you want to <laughs> calm down. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention one more time. Anybody that uh, you know wants to potentially interact with uh, this person that says they're Ken Kress that came back in January to social media. I'm not sure about Facebook, but certainly on X. Uh, Ken and Leah are both back. Um, I haven't checked since we've been on been live. He still hadn't answered my question about the uh, blunt and bloody instrument down the back of the rab that I posed to him. Maybe I need to delete that and just ask him directly. I'm not sure he's even looking at that other uh, that other thread, but I'll, I'll look later. Anyway, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us, all of our wonderful readers uh, for presenting this. Like I said, the next time we'll be going into um, um, oh, what the hell's his name here. Oh, yeah, Larry Conrad, another detective for MTSO. It is an interesting uh, deposition, and we'll, we'll be getting to that soon. We'll have a few more to finish out when I get these done. I'm not sure what we'll do next Sunday, but we'll see. May go ahead and jump back in and do his early calls. I haven't decided yet. It'll be one or the other. Anyway, with that said, if you like what we're doing, please consider liking the video, giving us a subscribe, sharing it with your friends, social media, whatever. And with that said, I'm going to say this has been a Foul Play production.